To me, digital security means protecting our identity and activities online, ensuring that our data and that our devices are not susceptible to intrusion. For me, digital security is being able to log into the online platforms that I enjoy so much without fear of my information being compromised or being used for malicious intent. Digital security is not sharing sensitive information with people online. This could be on social media, on websites, or online gaming. Digital security to me means the extent to which we are protected in our online activities, whether that be in the freedom of expressing our own opinions without fearing persecution, or the protection of our data and our information. Digital security for me means to know who, what, and for which purposes is my information going to be used. All of this trusting that this information is not going to be stolen. La seguretat digital per mi eh, significa estar protegit d'atacs cibernètics a nivell personal i nacional i protecció de dades personals de cara a empreses privades i campanyes polítiques que en fan un ús per benefici propi. Digital security and weather or Muga Kavasam Pole. In the Tolinut Pole Gatil, Nam Tani Nabar Alayalate, Pira Tavarana Muriel Pine Paritada Vanam Padga Kirate. Para mí, la seguridad digital es poder compartir información con las personas que yo decida y mis seres queridos y poder protegerlas en contra de el gobierno o de eh, empresas publicitarias que se aprovechan de esta información. Cyber security is having my data encrypted, stored safely, and not shared for any reason without my authorization. Digital security for me means knowing where each piece of information I have, whether on my laptop or phone, not only online, is where is it going, uh, who is using it and how. To me, digital security means a safe and protected space for everyone, the transparent use of data by companies, as well as the consideration of ethical implications for all digital technologies prior to the release to the public. So welcome to the Digital Security Workshop, which is part of the What Next for UN Festival and Conference. My name is Toma Morin and I will be the uh, moderator for this workshop. As many of you may know, this event is part of the larger UN 75 Global Conversation. To mark the UN Day tomorrow on the 24th of October, Secretary General Antonio Guterres announced that this year's commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations would feature a large and inclusive global conversation on the role of global cooperation in building the future we want. Well, this is what we're here for, to discuss what kind of digital future we want. I'm now going to go over the format of our workshop for this evening so that nobody gets confused and lost in the digital space-time continuum when we will begin shuffling around for our breakout sessions. Our workshop will last approximately two hours and is divided in two one-hour segments. The first is the breakout sessions and the second is the plenary session. There are three breakout sessions which will be taking place simultaneously, each dealing with a different aspect of digital security the goal is to try and take a holistic approach to this topic and then dis discuss everything together in the plenary session in the second half of this workshop. Our three breakouts are titled as follows, Human Rights in the Digital Age, Trust and Transparency, and Cybersecurity. Each breakout session is being chaired and run by our amazing digital security team who have thoroughly built this workshop with me over the past four months and each of these amazing people will contribute in their own ways to the discussions that will take place in each session. Our experts have also been divided up to contribute in the breakout sessions. They will be an integral part of the discussion within them and will contribute to the development of action points or recommendations, which designated rapporteurs will summarize for us in the second part of our workshop, the plenary session. The plenary session will simply consist in the reporting back from the breakout sessions which will fuel a discussion with our panelists. And I would ask you, the participants in this second section, to submit your questions, as I explained earlier, in the questions section at the bottom right of your screen, so that we can discuss your questions with our panelists. Our workshop will end by us attempting to delineate action points or recommendations on community, national, and international levels 
which we will present tomorrow during the UN Day Larger Festival, which you can all join in and attend also. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our expert contributors who are joining us tonight from all over the world. They represent a diverse group of individuals with various backgrounds and whose contributions will be invaluable during tonight's discussions. Let me introduce, first of all, um, our contributor to the panel, Yu Ping Chan. Yu Ping Chan leads the digital cooperation team in the Office of the Special Advisor to the Secretary General at the United Nations. There, she coordinates and oversees the team's work on follow-up to the security to the Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation and the roadmap to digital cooperation, as well as advocacy, engagement, and coordination efforts to strengthen global digital cooperation. Yu Ping Chan will be in the trust and transparency breakout session. Our second contributor in the panel is Yasmin Wilhan. Yasmin is the founder of We Belong a platform and podcast that amplifies the voice of the new daughters of Europe. She is also an advocate for social and gender justice in Europe, and she was recognized as Young European of the Year in 2019 by the Schwarzkopf Foundation, as well as EDD Young Leader by the European Commission, and Women Deliver Young Leader and a member of the Gender Innovation Agora at UN Women. Yasmin will be in the, UN human, in the human Rights and Digital Age breakout session. Our third contributor to the panel is Lobsang Gyatso Sidhar. Lobsang is a Tibetan born in exile dedicated to increasing cybersecurity among Tibetans inside Tibet and in the diaspora. Our fourth contributor on the panel is Bishaka Datta. Bishaka works on gender and sexuality in digital spaces. She runs the nonprofit Point of View in Mumbai, writes and films nonfiction, and is part of the Wikipedia family. In all her work, Bishaka explores marginal, invisible, and silenced points of view, or those that are considered illegitimate. Since 2015, Bishaka has led Point of View's flagship program on gender, sexuality, and technology, with equips, which equips and enables women, girls, trans, and non-binary people to inhabit digital spaces freely and fearlessly. Bishaka will be on the Human Rights in the Digital Age breakout session. Our fifth contributor on the panel is Professor Robert Krimer. Professor Robert Krimer holds the ERA Chair of Full Professorship of E-Governance within Skit Uni Institute at University of Tartu, Estonia. He continues to hold an assignment as Adjunct Professor of E-Governance in the Ragnar Norske de Department at Tallinn University of Technology. Robert's research is focused on digital transformation, cross-border e-services, electronic participation and democracy, as well as e-voting, and all issues further developing a digital society. Professor Krimer will be in the Trust and Transparency breakout session. Our sixth and final contributor is Ivan Fresnada. Ivan is an experienced entrepreneur in digital businesses and digital marketing. He created his first digital company in 2009, launching two e-commerce sites, among other projects. Since 2012, he has worked across big tech sector as a digital consultant. Ivan will be in the cybersecurity breakout session. Thank you all for being here and agreeing to contribute. We really value your presence and look forward to your input. To kick things off before the breakout sessions, you saw a short video at the beginning where we set out to ask young people from around the world, what does digital security mean to you? I'll now ask the same question to our expert contributors. Can you tell us in a couple of sentences before we move into the breakout sessions, what does digital security mean to you? I'd like to hear from everyone. Um, I think we can start with Yu Ping, if that's okay, Yu Ping Chan. Thank you, Toma. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this really exciting gathering of young voices and young people and perspectives around the world as to the future that we want on the occasion of the UN 75th anniversary. For me, digital security is a secure digital environment, an online, safe, accessible, and secure environment where all are free to realize their full potential and that we can maximize the benefits of digital technologies while mitigating their harms. And this is something that the Secretary General himself has committed the United Nations to work towards as we call for a push to improve digital cooperation. Thank you so much. Maybe we could hear from uh, Yasmin. Thank you so much, Toma. Thank you for having us today. Um, 
to me, digital security means um, in having the freedom to express our opinion and advocate uh, for human rights uh, without being compromised and without uh, being threatened on the work that we do as activists, but also um, having our data protected and our um, information. Thank you, Yasmin. Lobsang, maybe you would like to uh, to contribute? Uh, sure, sure, Thomas. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to first say thank you for having me. And yes, so for me, digital security is about being able to uh, share and express uh, online without fear of repercussions, as well as uh, kind of like having access to your own data. So understanding what data is being used online and what kind of data is being used, your kind of personal data is being used by different companies or whatever, and you having access to that data and that information. I think that's, yeah. So for me, I think that's digital security. Thank you. Thank you for that. Vishaka, would you like to uh, say your piece? Sure. Thanks for having me. I think for me, digital security means having the freedom to navigate online spaces fearlessly and with comfort, agency, and belonging, regardless of my gender, my sexuality, the language I speak, regardless of my income level, my race, my caste, like, you know, ability, all these things. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Krimer. Yeah, so Thomas, thanks so much for having me. It's a great honor to be able to contribute on this important topic of trying to understand how can we actually manage our digital future. For me, this transformation journey that we're all embracing onto is really one of the key elements. I mean, on the one side, myself, I, I consider myself as being a digital immigrant, Yeah, although I grew up with this transformation in the in the 90s with this big open space of something that we want to discover it almost felt like star trek right and so while riding this wave of digital transformation we all learned about mathematics right in the end the internet and this worldwide uh, engagement of digital technologies is about perfect information Right. I mean, for the first time in humankind, it is actually possible to have all the information available. And that actually challenges all the principles that we have embraced, that we have learned, that we have understood, whether that is about decision making, whether that is about participating in, in deliberation, whether that is about our essential needs of a human. Right. So in what we're doing right now, we're exchanging, we're giving appreciation to each other. And that is exactly what digital security in the, in the end is about. It is enabling our digital society, right? Digital society for me is this last evolution of a whole uh, process of going from a face-to-face -face society via a, a territorial society to this digital worldwide global society that we're having. And digital security actually enables that. And in the end, it's about mathematics, about the digital mindset, and about understanding what does it mean to participate in such an endeavor. Thanks for this. Thank you so much, Professor Krimer, for, for that contribution. Um, I think first and foremost, um, before we move into the breakout sessions, uh, it's important to highlight here, obviously, the um, the variations of understandings and conceptions of what digital security means to um, to everyone, depending as uh, as Vishaka said, depending on on who we are as people, digital security will have vastly different meanings and vastly different importances for us in our in our livelihoods. And I think that um, one of the things that we wanted to highlight as a as a team on the G digital security workshop. Um, through our video at the beginning and through also our, our, our experts who are here today was that it's important for us to understand as we move forward in this digital transformation that we understand that we are not alone and that we are not all facing this digital transformation in our society equally or in the same ways. It's, it's very much the opposite, actually. We're, we're um, apprehending this in very different ways. And um, the only way we can be successful 
and institutions, maybe multilateral institutions like the UN, can be successful in in addressing all of these many issues um, will be by um, hearing from everyone, hearing from as many different perspectives as possible and contributing to the conversation in that way. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our Human Rights in a Digital Age session. It's wonderful to see you all here. Well, we can see each other, but you can see us, so hello. <laughs> Uh, my name is Nuran Ragrag, and I am a master's graduate from International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS. And I'm also working on intersectional feminist foreign policy and gender and human rights. Uh, I'll be the chair for this session, and we'll have our two wonderful panelists here speak on the topic of digital security and human rights. And following that, we will have a discussion time and plenty of time to answer your questions. So please keep them coming as our session goes along. Um, we have uh, um, Aditi, Estelle, and Anahita. And I will first introduce the panelists and then our uh, the wonderful uh, digital security team. So Yasmin is the founder of We Belong, uh, as Toma has briefly mentioned, but I'll mention it again for all our new attendants. Um, and uh, it's a platform and podcast that amplifies the voice of the new daughters of Europe. She's also an advocate for social and gender justice in Europe, and she was recognized as Young European of the Year 2019 by the Schwarzkopf Foundation, EDD Young Leader by the European Commission, and Woman Deliver Young Leader, and also a member of the Gender Innovation Agora at UN Women. Welcome, Yasmin. Um, and Bishaka is currently heading Point of View in Mumbai, which is an organization that builds and amplifies the voices of women and other marginalized genders, and they focus on sexuality, disability, and technology. Welcome, Bishaka. Um, my colleague uh, Estelle is a second year student of international development and environment at UEA, and she's an intern at Peace Child. Um, Aditi is a writer and researcher in the areas of human rights, post-conflict justice, and climate change. And my colleague Anahita is a current master's student at SOAS, and she researches gender intersectionality and international security with an interest in human rights. And this is what brings us all here together. So we have a question for the participants, and you can answer that later. We are participants, I can't see you. But it is, what is your biggest fear while being online? So please tune in after. And let's start with Yasmin. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much so for much. providing this platform. I hope that you can hear me well. Mm -hmm. um, so I will start by saying that for me, being online as an activist, it's, you know, not only need, but it's a, it's a space that we take and a space as much as we do offline, we also use the online space to work. And so what we do, then, of course, there are some um, challenges that we can face. Um, and if I have one advice to give is don't be afraid. When you use those online platforms, you will always be the target of criticism and sometimes threats. But it's, it's not, you know, as much as in the street, you should be protected. You should also be protected online. And so I'm not afraid. Right, um, because I made a choice to expose myself and to and to speak up no matter what. But then, of course, when you receive threats, uh, death threats, and also um, when you are harassed, as I was by hundreds of people online, then you have to find enough, you know, um, you know enough strength to keep up and to be resilient enough. And that's what I did. When I found it, we belong with other two young women. It was after being recognized the young European of the year that caused me hundreds of hate online and being also attacked by the French far right leader of France that I sued on court. So it took a legal step. So we have many tools, right? I will just bring here some ideas, but we have many legal and uh, online tools to protect ourselves. But then, of course, it's legitimate and human to be afraid then we should turn this fear into a you know an 
this strength in order to continue to push for our rights. Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful insight and also for sharing your experience. I can't imagine how difficult it is to overcome, but you've done a great job. Um, I would also like to introduce Bishaka now. Hello, hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Platform change. Yes. Um, may you please share what your biggest fear of being online is? Or what you have faced or experienced? Yeah, um, I think my biggest fear actually is, uh, you know, that my data would be used in a way that would really compromise me. For example, we are really seeing nowadays in India a lot of uh, people's data being stolen, and you know, including identity theft. And I feel like some of those things are really hard to deal with. We've also had a number of cases in the during the uh, last few months when we've been working from home, right? We've been using digital platforms much more for everything, you know, and a lot of people uh, have basically ended up with like money vanishing from their bank accounts. And because we are relying so much on the digital nowadays, I feel like a lot of stuff that I wasn't that scared of earlier, including literally like, you know, am I going to wake up one day and find that, you know, my money has vanished or something has happened, etc. All of it just seems totally real today, right? And that's sort of what's my current biggest fear. Thank you so much, Vishaka, for your insight and also for sharing um, on what it means to have your data stolen. And obviously, we will explore this more. Um, okay, so. Hi, everyone. My name is Anahita. Thank you so much to our speakers both. Um, I think for me, something that's super interesting, I think, is issues of privilege. For example, the experience of a user online as a young woman of color is going to be very different, I'm sure, as you know, than a white male, for example. Um, and how do we tackle this on a global level when we're trying to make sure that the digital space becomes more equal and accessible for everybody and make sure that there are actual kind of material tools that make this easy and safe? Thank you, Anahita. Um, I would like to ask one of our panelists if they have something to say regarding issues of privilege and race in the digital us. Okay, you know, uh, actually, thank you for asking that question, Anahita, because I think one of the things we are really seeing is when you don't have privilege, and I really wanted to talk about sort of, uh, you know, families that have low incomes, right, and are really struggling to make a living. One of the things we are really seeing is that there's a lot of gender discrimination when it comes to the use of digital devices, right? So, for example, in many families in India where I live, we find that if you're in a low-income family and there are very scarce resources and you pretty much have enough money to just buy one mobile phone, right, for the whole family. Well, guess who gets to use that mobile phone mainly, right? It's either going to be the father, it's going to be the son in the family, whereas, you know, often the mother or the daughter, or if there's a trans uh, daughter, they really get left out, right? So I think part of the problem with the whole uh, sort of issue is that we are really seeing a situation where a number of women, girls, trans people, etc., don't even have access to digital devices. And if they do have access, you know, then their use is continuously monitored, right? And it's kind of similar to sort of that whole offline thing of don't go out at night if you're a woman, right? Like, and it's like, don't use the mobile at night. 
you know, always justify your use, etc. So I just wanted to bring in that dimension, actually. And if I could just jump in, of course, I come from a very different perspective because I am based in France, based in Europe. Like having worked also um, with people with underprivileged background in my country, in my city, uh, um, you know, I can say that within the global uh, pandemic uh, that we faced uh, and the forced digitalization that we were exposed to, there is young people who couldn't have access to the internet, even just for education. This is a huge problem. I'm also Moroccan by roots. And I know that many people back in my country of origin couldn't even have access to, to education anymore at all um, just because of the internet. And as uh, Vishaka mentioned it, when you are in a family uh, with a low income and then there is only one mobile, then you know who this mobile will be priority, you know, be given to. And then there is a huge gap in terms of access to digitalization, right? Um we're also working, uh, also working with colleagues from the African Union uh, as an expert for the European Union and the African Union. And many of them don't even have access to the internet anymore. It's very difficult. There is shutdowns when you live uh, in countries where uh, there is very few access to, to, to the internet, but also that there is, you know, government and regimes that, uh, that just, you know, take uh, ownership of, of who should have internet and when and why and how, then, yeah, there is a huge uh, inequality that it's created uh, within countries, but also um, across countries. So it's important to mention. Thank you for, for the question. Thank you so much, uh, both Bishaka and Yasmin. Um, and thank you for answering the questions very eloquently. Um, I believe we have a few questions from our end, and then we can start with the attendees. Uh, please, anyone attending, remember to write your questions here on the toolbar so we can see them. Thank you so much. Um, Estelle, would, would you like to? Hello. Um, yes, it's actually kind of surrounding the same issue of diversity. Um, my question, because there was a reasonably recent study done um, by the AI Now Institute of New York, um, and they really claimed that there was a diversity disaster in terms of flawed AI systems being made um, that perpetuate gender bias and issues surrounding diversity. And that's really, really such a massive issue I feel, um, especially because we're we're really heading into an age which is um, quite heavily involved with technology. Um, so I was really, I really wanted to ask you, how can we really um, solve and address this issue of diversity within the workforce of AI and technology and that kind of thing? I think it is super important to work on AI and you know correct the bias of the learning machine that just. Um, they repeat the mistake of humans. And so if we are, you know, racist or if we are not, you know, gender, uh, promoting gender equality, then also the machines will do. So it is important, of course, to have uh, diversity and inclusion consultants working with engineers and AI experts in order to bridge this gap, I would say. And then uh, I think people like us, you know, uh, people of color that uh, might have this uh, cultural sensitivity, but also understanding what we go through in real life, because it is often repeated on the internet and on the way then we face discrimination through uh, AI. So I would just keep it brief. I would say, yeah, we need to have more consultants uh, on this and uh, be as intersectional as possible, because when we talk about diversity, it's not only about gender, it's not only about race, it's also about class, and it can also be around, about so many other elements that cause our discrimination. So it's super important to keep in mind that uh, element. Okay, I totally agree with uh, what Yasmina said, and just building on that, you know, a couple of points. I think one is, 
it's really important to think about who creates technology, right? Like ultimately, whether it's software, whether it's artificial intelligence, whatever it is, it's being created by human beings. And who are the human beings who are creating technology? And here we see a huge bias, right? Sort of like the Silicon Valley bias. So it's really a hell of a lot of technology is still created by white men. And what that then means is that, you know, all of us, when we create things, we sort of imagine a world, right? Or we imagine the people we are creating it for. And often we create technology, which is very much for people like ourselves. So I think one of the things is we really need to get more people of like, you know, women, we need to get queer people, non-binary people, and then we can sort of reimagine some of these technologies, including artificial intelligence. And I actually want to give one example from the United States. There's a fantastic scholar called Joy Bulamwini, who's from Ghana. And she has done this amazing work where she looks at how AI actually looks at black women and, you know, she looks at everybody literally from like Michelle Obama to Sojourner Truth, right? And she finds that most of the new systems don't recognize them as women. So it's a really awful situation because the AI has been trained in a way where it's much more likely to be accurate when it comes to recognizing certain genders, but really has biases around race and gender. And I think there's a lot of stuff she talks about where, you know, hair, et cetera, et cetera, is just not recognized by AI. So we need diversity behind the scenes in the Thank metro. You. Thank you so much, Bashar Khan. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, I believe we have a question from Aditi, and then we will move on to the Q&A for that. Yeah. Thank you, Nuran. So I will first point out my biggest fear when I am in the digital space. I, re I would really feel secure if my behavior is not manipulated online. And that's, I think, one of the biggest issues that we are facing in the human rights space. And my question also ties in into the questions asked here by one of our attendees who, said, who gave the example of Nigeria and said they experienced a crackdown on freedom of speech. And that's what I have observed, we all have observed throughout the world, be it in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, in the African subcontinent, in, in American subcontinent, everywhere there has been a rise of governments and corporations coming together in order to crack down on free speech, in order to crack down on any voices of dissent. And more than that, manipulating behavior, not just to vote, but to create an environment of unrest so that we become intolerant towards other ideas that, which we don't know or we don't understand towards another human being, towards another thing which is unknown. So this is a question I would like to be discussed in the realm of human rights within the digital security space. Thank you. I will make it very brief. Um, right before I was mentioning that I'm working with the African Union and two of my colleagues, they are from Nigeria. And as we speak, they are losing friends who are protesting in the street to yeah. ask for people. They're asking for people in response, they're having more, more violence, right? But then, you know, the question I find it super interesting, the one that Shama sent on the, in the chat, it's freedom of ease speech. Because even speaking in the internet can cause them to be uh, charged or to, be, to face, you know, even more violence and to be threatened. So it is important to create spaces and tools to allow activists to express themselves freely as much as we're speaking about Nigeria, we can speak about also Hong Kong people, how brave they are, right? To keep uh, advocating for their rights and their freedom, despite all. So um, as when it comes to institution, I think we should help uh, institution and international organizations accountable, uh, but also asking other governments, as the European Union, for example, we are uh, working together with 
with activists in order to make sure that their voice is heard at least in other regions so they can put pressure on uh you know third governments um yeah that's just my quick thank you so much uh bishaka you will also have one minute please i mean i think you know the freedom of speech question now is super complicated because corporations now are controlling our speech so much on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And um, they're just like, it's a very complicated situation where I don't think we yet know how to deal with the kind of power they have over us. So I'm just going to leave it at that for now. Um, Thank you so much. Um, to look at, uh, I know we've uh, mentioned a few of the questions on the list. Um, I'm gonna ask this one from Dorothy. Um, she says, how can the UN intervene when governments arrest activists, journalists, based on their social media comments that are questioning the government? Okay, I think, you know, the UN sets standards for the whole world, right? And I think when activists and que uh, journalists are questioned based on say, social media comments, there's a lot of scrutiny on other activists and journalists within that country who try and support them, right? And it becomes really risky and dangerous. I think it's really important at that point for the UN to actually directly intervene and really push uh, governments, you know, to sort of say that dissent is not necessarily or questioning is not a crime and that it's part of a democracy, right? And we honestly, in these kinds of situations, we need global support. We need international support. It's much less risky for people outside the country and for bodies like the UN, which are respected, to sort of really try and negotiate with governments and push them. Yeah. So just to come in, I know that when there is uh, threats to human rights, there are special um, um, rapporteurs to the, UN, to the UN, for example, on minority issues, on contemporary forms of, of racism, uh, on torture, um, on promotion of truth and justice. There is a, a range of uh, rapporteurs that we can contact. And I know this because I was recently uh, part of a consultation of the UN for digital safety. And uh, it's tools that we don't even know. And we need to make sure that we are free to contact them and that they can also uh, push governments uh, to, um, to you know, respect the convention that they sign. Right? Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, Adit? Yeah, so one of the biggest discussions that going that is going on um, in the entire UN circle and even beyond that is to make these co private corporations responsible. One of the biggest reasons in, in conflict zones as well, these contracts are going to private parties is because they do not fall under the normal rules of conduct when it comes to the international stage. So I think UN can be instrumental in making the countries uh, feel that they need to implement rules so that the corporations registered within their boundaries do come under the purview of the law where they are being questioned. And also these corporations need to be way more strictly. Uh, we have seen this in uh, US Congress also where Zuckerberg was called and all these big figures were called and questioned on that, but nothing transpired post that. So apart from simply making a media trial out of it, I think we would benefit from concrete laws which would come into the picture. And UN is still a very, very influential organization. So, and it is composed of individual bodies from across the world. So we can make UN as effective as we want to be, want it to be as people, because ultimately our representatives are on, on that body. So UN taking a, a strong stand against private corporations would go, uh, would be a very huge step in um, making sure the digital space is secure for all of us. This is from Amy or Amy. 
Um, she says that AI has now been touted as capable of identifying sexuality. Um, this is a danger to uh, homophobic and, tra and homophobic and transphobic, uh, transphobic countries and communities. Sorry, uh, is that still a, prob a probability? It is still a probability because you know AI depends on machine learning. And machine learning depends on what you feed the machine. So if you are only feeding the machine, basically like heterosexual kind of, you know, up data, right? Then it picks that up as the norm. And it basically ends up doing in digital space what has already happened in physical space, which is not treating all sexualities as sort of diverse and equal etc but sort of treating heterosexuality as the norm and everything else as sort of you know different and othering other sexualities so yeah so basically you know the machines ai learns by getting more and more and more and more data so the more diverse we can make it and the more we can get in trans data you know, queer data, etc. the more it will recognize these as, uh, but it's a tough challenge, honestly. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Bishaka. Um, we have seven more minutes, so we're going to leave the last five minutes for us to introduce possible solutions from the panelists and the team. I know we've all brainstormed this a lot. So I'm going to ask one last question from our audience. I'm going to ask this to Yasmin. How to distinguish cybercrime being initiated through legitimate platforms slash host sites, such as TikTok, even though there are means to distinguish imitators of the legitimate platform? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenge. Also, it is important to reflect on what it is it to be a legitimate platform, right? Because we know that even platforms like TikTok were criticized of censoring activists, right? And so um, is there you know, a, a space where we can um, feel protected? I think for me, even Twitter, I don't feel protected to, to be on Twitter. I have, every time I tweet, I have threats but then we, we still do it. So how can we distinguish cybercrime from, uh, you know, a platform or another when uh, the, the, the problem is also that sometimes it's you know, hidden, a hidden form of, of crime. It's, uh, um, it's very difficult to understand and to explain uh, legally with the legal tools that we have right now uh, whether something is just a joke or whether it is uh, an actual threat, so um, so yeah, we need we need to redesign uh, uh, our legal system, but also our online safety um, um, rules. Let's see. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, so for the last five minutes, we would like to discuss action points and solutions to the issues of human rights in the digital space and all the uh, issues that we have discussed in detail. Um, I, <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, uh, we would, okay, Bishaka, may you please start? Uh, uh, please keep in mind. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'll try and talk about a couple of things. I think one is uh, we really need sort of a right to access the internet. And I think the time has come for that to actually be recognized as a human right. I think after the last six months, how can we ever disagree about this, right? So I think that's one. Um, I think the second thing is, you know, maybe looking really at how do you distinguish between what is legitimate expression online and what is harmful expression online and really having standards for that. And the third thing I would actually want to talk about is just consent. Often the dis distinction between what is legitimate and illegitimate in all forms of expression, including sexual expression, 
is consent. And we really need to build cultures of consent online and offline. I couldn't agree more with what has been said by Vishaka. I think it is important to start by reflecting that it is impossible to live in a society where not everybody has his space. And as we switch into a digital society, especially through uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to make sure that every and each and everyone has its space too in this um, in this new um, environment. And then um, making sure that you know when I am in the street and somebody attacks me in the street, um, there is a law protecting me. So when somebody attacks me online, we should also be sure that I am protected there too. And so finding and working with governments to reflect on uh, protection on data, but also protection of, um, uh, of citizens while guaranteeing freedom of speech. And I think freedom of speech uh, is a universal, uh, a, 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 you know, a guarantee and a value till the time that it threatens our life. So, you know, uh, it is important to make sure that we continue to work um, and and push governments uh, to uh, rule on our digital safety. Very quickly, um, tying in to both Bushaka and Yasmin's points, I think there is it's high time that we have concrete laws and guidelines how corporations can or cannot manipulate and influence people's behaviors online because that is causing the maximum distortion and distraught in the society in today's world. That's all. Thank you. Um, I really agree with everything that's been said today. Thank you so much to our speakers. I think um, personally, something I think is super important is finding ways to facilitate more multilateral efforts at this. The UN can really act as a space that can bring a lot more higher standards in terms of what we consider to be digitally secure and safe online, um, to find ways of incentivizing um, individual states to make legal frameworks that not only protect our data and go far beyond GDPR, but for example, in the UK, but also protect individual rights. Um, and I think that's something that needs to for sure be considered, especially I think in a sense, the online space is a very like dual space it's empowering and it's incredible for collective action especially when it's transnational but you know there are a lot of limitations to it as well and i think governments should have individual kind of um responsibilities to address that on a far larger scale so i really agree with everything thank you um thank you so much everyone for the points that have been said i really really love everything that's been said um, just touching back on the diversity issue, I really do think that it's something that really needs to be addressed and encouraging people from oh, like a, a really wide range of backgrounds to get more involved with AI and technology and supporting um, teams and the general public to kind of unpick um, biases that we have towards certain groups to ensure that we really do encourage um, youth and people from the general public to get more involved with this field. Um, thank you everyone for your contributions. I believe, and I saw one of the questions or rather a suggestion was saying that the need for a universal um, digital human rights uh, sort of manual or legal framework for all of us to establish that we do have e-human rights in which we can protect ourselves on these platforms and just like we can protect ourselves on the streets via the universal declaration of human rights and i think it's important that uh, youth uh, women non-binary every <clears throat> segment of society is covered under this declaration so that people in marginalized communities, people in the global south, people who who have no voice in general can be protected under this new platform. Uh, I remember someone was saying that we were forcefully pushed to this digital migration during this pandemic, and I think that was perfectly put. And therefore, this this space needs governance as well. And I think everyone did so well thank you so much for your inputs thank you to our attendant attendees for the questions uh i hope we have managed to shed some lights on the issues that that are ongoing 
someone was mentioning issues in Nigeria and Ghana, uh, issues with the uh, TikTok in Egypt, censorship against youth on all over platforms. And sometimes we forget how bad it can get. So this is really interesting and it has been inspiring to talk to everyone. So a big part of the problems at the moment um, are the design and development of contemporary technologies that are neither ethical nor transparent to the user. And um, by these technologies, I mean all sorts of platforms that we use every day. I will refer to these corporate as big tech, which include Google and Amazon and Facebook and all these. Um, and it is essential to understand here that uh, the users are not the customers. If we pay with something, we pay because we don't pay with money for these services. We pay with our attention and our data. The actual customers could be seen, um, or the advertisers could be seen as the, as the actual um, customers because they actually pay to advertise to us. Um, this whole it's turning attention into a currency system could also be referred as the attention economy. And how this all works is that um, a lot of data is collected and will be set into AI systems that through machine learning um, figure out or are programmed to learn about how to best target us. And um, so we each enter a digital ecosystem that is very personalized to us and us only. And um, how this all works is that they, they need a lot of our attention in order for us to generate data. And it's not only content data here, so not only what we post, but also con uh, data in form of behavioral data. So how long we look at a post or what we search for, or our whole patterns online. And um, we enter this kind of whole cycle of generating more data. Um, in generating more data, the AI systems get more efficient in targeting us, get more of our attention, and then they generate more data and so on and so on. And um, what systems that are important to mention here are recommender systems, for instance, that we all encounter every day in like Netflix or Amazon or Facebook in our feeds. So um, the AIs develop predictions on what the user will probably be interested in and then recommend it to them. The problem with this is that it leads to the confirmation bias. So as the algorithm tries to recommend to us what we're most interested in, when we actually want to find something out, it will already recommend to us what we already believe in. So our opinion won't necessarily change about a subject. And we enter a whole filter, which could also be referred to echo chamber, where the user is surrounded only by this personalized technology and a balance of use is just not possible. So we're isolated in this perspective that the algorithms provide for us. Um, and this leads to polar polarization and radicalization, which can also be seen a lot in America at the moment. Um, so effects entail fake news, conspiracy theories, extremism, and even physical violence. So what the problem is here is the business model, because for big tech, more data means more money, and there's no fiscal reason for them to change. So they do not seem to care much about the users, so about all of us. And apart from these aforementioned effects, which are also like extremely important, um, there have been other devastating uh, events throughout the globe. So in Myanmar, for instance, Facebook has been weaponized and that led to a genocide. Um, in Egypt, for instance, um, several women have been arrested uh, up in appropriation because they were posting videos on TikTok like um, many other people around the globe do. But in Egypt, 
the police found this uh, offensive. So uh, what I want to say with this is that big tech doesn't care about different regulations in different countries or different risks for other people. Um, apparently, it's just important to them to, as long as the people are just using the technology and gener generating data, it's fine for them. Um, but back to the data collection part, um, privacy is essential. And I've met many people who are saying, uh, well, I don't have anything to hide, so um, they can gather my data, it's okay. But it's not only about the individual anymore, it's also about the collective. And this has, or this can be a challenge to democracy itself. So a very prominent um, example of this is the Cambridge Analytica incident um, in the pre presidential election in um, 2016, where Cambridge Analytica was illegally um, using a lot of Facebook's data to specifically target voters. And how they were doing that is they were targeting voters that seemed uncertain. And then based on all the data they had on them, they tried to psychologically figure out how to best influence them. So do, get they, do they get people to vote by making them angry or scared or just confirming whatever they already believe with? Um, and yeah, so um, all these developments can lead to a simultaneous dystopia and utopia. There are obviously some good developments. I've just been talking about the bad things here. Um, there is a higher standard of living for many people. There is an improvement in um, healthcare and in security. Um, but the problem is with so much data that if the algorithms get so sophisticated that they predict every single move that we do, we could completely lose hum any human agency. And these parts of data provide and these parts of data provide infinite opportunities for abuse. Imagine communication and location data in the hand of government or company that is not really playing by the rules. This is actually the dream of any author, authoritarian uh, leader. We are willing to trust anyone with this much power? I don't really think so. To tell us um, about how to best avoid such scenarios, I'm handing over to Sukaina now um, to give us a legal perspective of these things. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm now going to lay the groundwork for a part of our conversation by presenting a brief overview of the current issues and developments pertaining to data regulation. So first, uh, I will begin by touching on our international legal framework and where it falters. Um, despite the maturing consensus that international law applies in cyberspace, the debate has now shifted to how it applies. Certain principles are widely accepted by states, such as the right to self-defense in cyberspace. Others received mixed reaction on their scope and content. That is the case for um, the principle of sovereignty, for instance. States are likewise divided on whether existing treaties and customary law is adequate, um, which would mostly be the position held by Western states, whereas other states argue that new instruments are necessary. And that is the case of China, India, Russia, Pakistan, just to name a few. And perhaps the proponents of the latter have a point when we consider the fact that international uh, law was not equipped to look at the threats posed to individual privacy uh, from data collection when uh, human rights instruments were conceptualized. And also when we look at the fact that there has been limited uh, progress coming out of the UN and that it has failed so far to yield consensus um, as it has now birthed two groups of member states tackling these issues, uh, which are divided along the conceptual lines that I have just mentioned. Um, although the Cambridge Analytica put tremendous focus on privacy, no substantial enhancements in fun fundamental, uh, sorry, in fundamental international legal protection of the right to privacy occurred, and a more robust framework is needed um, in order to ensure that individuals' data is not arbitrarily exploited. To that end, we need to clarify what the right to privacy means nowadays, given our techno technological advancements. Um, we are also in a position where we have to determine what the obligations of states are in terms of bulk surveillance. And uh, we also need to figure out the tricky notion of companies under international law. Another issue that we can touch on is that of extraterritorial surveillance. Uh, carried out by states. States tend to interpret their human rights obligations to enable them to gather intelligence 
Uh, not only do they carry out bulk surveillance on their soil, uh, generally under the guise of national security, but they also do so abroad as Snowden's revelation brought to light. The thing is, there is supposed to be a certain extent of legal review when surveillance operations take place domestically, but states completely absolve themselves uh, of similar procedures when it comes to operations happening outside their territory. Um, this, in fact, creates a loophole which, enable, uh, which enables intelligence agencies to circumvent any national restrictions that are in place protecting their own citizens' right to privacy as they collect their respective citizens' data and then proceed to exchange it. These practices illustrate further why clear and solid international instruments are required and why we cannot leave it to unbinding voluntary-based ba measures. As Roxana has said, data is extremely valuable, and as it is now constantly being said, uh, data is the new oil. Although recent international legal developments ha uh, are unsatisfactory, it is, um, uh, and its future trajectory seems very bleak, improvements and reforms have been made. It is noteworthy to mention they occurred at a regional scale, however, not an international one. We believe the most notable steps in the right directions are the following. So the invalidation of the two frameworks by European courts, which allowed for European citizens' data to be transferred to big company, uh, big tech companies housed in the U.S., Courts struck down uh, these agreements uh, primarily because European data would then feed into data that the U.S. intelligence is collecting. And the courts also deemed that the protection afforded in the U.S. were not equivalent to that granted in Europe. Another step in the right direction is perhaps the decision rendered last May by the German Constitutional Court, which ruled that mass surveillance breached the German constitution and confirmed that foreign nationals under surveillance were constitutionally protected. The Court of Justice of the European Union also issued a judgment this month stating that unhindered bulk surveillance does not does constitute sorry, a breach of the right to privacy as defined in EU law. And the court expressed it ought to be capped to what is strictly necessary. Um, another important development that we can see is the California Privacy Rights and Enforcement Act of 2020, which is due to be voted on um, as part of uh, the next U.S. presidential election in a couple of days, uh, which seeks to abate and enhance the California privacy protections. It will, in turn, de facto impact the whole of the U.S., um, it's framed as leg legislation that will better protect their privacy, in particular sensitive data, such as social security numbers, race, religion, and health information. The law is supposed to uh, more clearly limit data collection and use of third parties and the use of geolocalization data, among other things. And it will also fund the creation of an agency to protect consumer privacy. Uh, when we compare that to the GDPR, which, although it is described as the most advanced data protection regime in the world, it has insidious effects um, in that it strengthened the largest players and big tech companies have been able to effectively neuter the law by implementing half measures and exploiting loopholes while enforcement still lags. Uh, like I said in the outset, we need to clarify what the right to privacy means what the obligations of states are and the status of companies. This can either be done globally or regionally and nationally. Uh, we would argue that international instruments are more desirable because they carry more weight. Um, however, we could also maybe adopt a two track solution system where we let the law develop regionally and nationally alongside with uh, international solutions. Thank you very much, Sakaina. Um, now I would like to start our um, expert discussion. And uh, just a quick reminder of who our experts are for those who just joined us. So we have Professor Krimmer, who is a professor of e-governance at Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. And we have uh, Yu Ping Chang, who is the Digital Cooperation um, team lead in the office of the Special Advisor to the Secretary General at the United Nations. 
All right, um, before we delve into our questions, um, I would like to ask you two experts to comment or add anything um, to the aforementioned. Um, so what is for you, what is the alarming issue here? And I think I would like to start with you, Ping. Thanks so much, Roxana. To be very honest, the thing that struck me listening to some of the presentations today is that we come from the perspective and the assumption that everybody has access to digital technologies and hence, the fundamental concern is the use of the technology and privacy and the use of our personal data that we exchange via these technologies. But for 3.6 billion people in the world, they do not have access to proper technology and digital technology. So for them, even the question of access to technology, the internet, broadband and so forth, is really a privilege and a luxury they don't have. So it's just a sort of a comment that as we reflect on what it is that we need internationally as well, perhaps greater regulation, greater legal instruments and so forth, Perhaps we should also recognize the fact that the UN's core mandate is not just those who have it, but also those who have not. And in some ways, that has been the focus of the United Nations efforts to ensure that all of us around the world, the 3.6 billion people who remain unconnected, first have access to these technologies. And then we can talk about the privilege of ensuring that these technologies are used in the right way. So to some extent, part of the reason why the UN might not have been as active in terms of the area of privacy is because some of its focus and a lot of its attention is on achieving connectivity for development. And I agree with you that in building these types of connectivity, we need to make sure that it's done in a safe and human rights respecting way. But just something to keep in mind as we go forward in these discussions. Of course, thank you for the comment. Um, maybe we should have mentioned that uh, given the capacity of each breakout group, we decided to focus this particular trans 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 transparency um, session on uh, most um, companies that are used here and the issues that around uh, revolve here. So a lot of these issues of um, access is being discussed in the other, um, specifically women rights um, section. But thank you for mentioning that. Maybe it's good for the audience too. And uh, yeah, now, um, Robert, if you would like to comment. Yeah, I mean, um, the point that we have here, I think Yuping Chan made a, made a very important point that access is you know, so to speak, like the enablement of participating in this digital society. The question, of course, is at which price? And that's exactly what we all realized when we started out with this endeavor. And so, I mean, I, I still imagine where I was grateful for having someone to talk to when you're going online, right? I mean, it was at the times when we didn't have a permanent internet connection, where we were just dialing up. And then, you know, you were happy that you actually had an email. That meant basically, you know, somebody's appreciating. So... What today maybe is a like, back then it was an email. And uh, in, in that sense, you know, we made many mistakes back in the days, right? So, I mean, some of the posts that I made in the Fidonet at the time in the large private where nobody was considering that any of the information that we would put out there would be accessible today. But the fact is contributions that I made more than 30 years ago to uh, the public bulletin board in this private network are still accessible today in, 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 in the internet for everyone that is connected to it right now. So what it means is that we certainly somehow need to establish a minimum uh, uh, criteria. What does it mean that you are actually getting uh, connected to the internet with protecting your human rights, right? Like how we do in other elements like elections or other other elements where we're trying to assess them, there are certain minimum criteria for us to uh, understand that this is a trustworthy instrument. And as such, uh, we also talk about the internet in that sense of connecting everyone to it. And especially that in that way, we need to... Oh, looks like we lost Robert. Yeah, Can sorry I... for, for, for my uh, mobile connection. So what I said is we have a certain responsibility of, of those of us that are connected for actually protecting those that are not connected because we have the experience, we have the knowledge, and we actually need to say like what works, what doesn't work and kind of setting the minimum uh, criteria. Second, when we talk about trust and transparency, we're actually talking about something which means I have no need to check this technology further than what I have experienced because it works for me. Right. I mean, that's what trust means. I don't expect negative consequences from it, but I can only enable that when I actually understand, meaning that I have built my digital mindset. I have understood how the technology works and I have the effective means to control them. Right. And that goes along with knowledge. 
actually having the technological means, meaning I can actually use the cryptography uh, to, to enable my uh, secure connection. And that hasn't been always the case, right? Remember those days in the, in the 90s when the US were actually not allowing us to export uh, cryptography and then only other countries had to build it based on the publications that are available in the, in the academic world. So actually having access to cryptography is one of the basic means of ensuring trust into the information technology. And that would be something I would like to contribute. Um, so I, I can't ask all the questions that I've prepared, but I think what we would really like to know from you specifically is um, in regards to your recent paper, um, why the pandemic may have uh, may pave the way for online voting. Um, what benefits could e-voting and e-citizenship hold and what are the risks? No, I mean, you know, it, it, it is exactly go riding this wave of digitization, right? So when we are actually bringing all of our life online, it actually means that we need to be able to do everything we're used to in the paper-based world, also in the digital. And that's exactly where this perfect information that we have in this digital society actually challenges the fundamental principles we're using in the paper-based world, right? So the freedom of expression, expression is based very much on this element that we cannot be extorted, that we cannot be influenced, that we cannot be uh, coerced. And in terms of elections, that comes down to being protected using a wall around us being the polling booth, yeah? When we talk about online, you know, we, we're pretty much unprotected. Whether that is behind the computer, somebody's behind me and puts a gun to my head, you know, there is not much I can do. Of course, the electronic means allow me to vote as often as I want, but I need cryptography. And if I don't have the access to the cryptography in a trustworthy way, all of the online elections are basically null and, and void. And in very very often it means to rely to organizational trust. So if you go to election buddy or many of those voting tools that you have in Zoom or all the other online participation means, they're just not good enough. So ensuring a secure, anonymous way of participating is not easy. It actually comes very costly and it needs things like the what the Estonians are doing where I'm living actually. It requires quite a little quite a level of, of technological capacity. They have managed to do it in a very trustworthy way that every second voter in Estonia is using the online means, but that's not something you can guarantee all around the world because at the moment, this is still something very challenging to do. But what it means, if we don't continue to do research in this area, we'll be soon forced to be yeah, basically manipulable in all areas of our decision making around the world because we have to do the decisions online and if we don't have the means we'll be forced to basically vote out in the open with all the possibilities of coercion and thank you robert uh, i would just like to ask you um following this what would you like for the un to do or what could the un or what, what are you hoping for the un to take um in terms of taking action for this no i mean i think that the most crucial part is building capacity really bringing this digital mindset to the people and actually enabling them to understand what they're doing, right? When we see the African continent really embracing digital by uh, using mobile phones in every possible means for their daily banking business, for their exchange of information, then that also means that we need to educate them what does it mean that you exchange that information. Otherwise, we'll have the situation that in 30 years' time, their private communication, which they believe to be private, will be completely out in the open with all the consequences that will come from that. So I think the UN needs to really enforce this education of people all around the world, exactly what the Estonia did back in 1997 with the Tiger Leap, Tiger Leap Initiative. They started to educate the people who today are the ones that... Um, I actually would like to touch on uh, one of the questions that somebody can wrote. First, I don't know if we could do that. finish the questions with the experts and then I, I just wanted to ask you, Peng, uh, one more thing and then we get to the sure. um, Yeah, first off, uh, maybe briefly, um, how would you respond to... Um, Robert's statement, or do you think the UN can realize this? So I think he's right, really. And this kind of links back to what I was starting off this conversation by saying, that a lot of these expectations are founded on an assumption that there is capacity that exists globally for these kinds of things. 
And then at the point that so many people actually don't really even have access to technology and don't have the ability to go online, then what we then need is the building of that capacity in a way that from the start enshrines these types of principles of privacy. So be it privacy by design, cooperation with national governments or the private sector companies that go into a country and actually set up these types of infrastructure already respect such principles. It has to be there from the start or we're going to play catch up in the same way that you've got, we're now doing in a lot of these situations. So I think the question about whether it should be the UN's role about, or whether it's someone else is sort of fundamental to this issue. And I'm not really sure. I mean, I work for the United Nations. I am very frank about the limitations and the realities that we actually face here at the United Nations. Certainly, there is a huge emphasis on capacity building, and there's a desire by developing countries to have the UN assist in these ways. But in order for us to be able to build these systems, which already have privacy by design or human rights respecting elements built in from the start, it's already a challenge that is not necessarily something that, as you yourself point out, big companies are willing to do from the start. Because in some ways, you're adding an additional burden onto what would be presuming upon their largesse to help African countries build these types of infrastructure in the first place. So perhaps it also goes back to what you initially mentioned, that the business model is already something that inhibits the creation of these safeguards and protections for people that go online. So at the point that we face this conundrum, how do we partner with private sector companies and private investors in such a way that we can build these capacity in African countries, but at the same time incentivize them to actually have these protections in place so that they would be willing to support the UN in going into these African countries to build the capacity that is absent in the first place is something that the UN is still grappling with. And to be very frank, I mean, I'm not sure that we've actually reached that kind of balance. The Secretary General of the United Nations has said that, you know, the United Nations can bring people together in this type of collaborative framework. And we are working towards that. But it requires balancing of all these different interests in a way that, like I said, still incentivizes private companies to go in, support the UN and build capacity in a way that we all agree is rights protecting, protects privacy and data, but still provides them with that business model that allows them to generate enough profits for them to even agree to do so in the first place. Thank you, Yuping. Uh, maybe directly connected. Um, so uh, what are concrete actions that you think the UN should take um, or should be thinking uh, to take in the next few years? So this is where, for instance, the Secretary General has laid out a plan for how the international community should engage on digital cooperation. And it's not just in the area of trust and transparency, digital trust and security, but across elements that we've talked about already, capacity building, universal connectivity, very closely related to this digital human rights, uh, digital inclusion, digital cooperation architecture. So the Secretary General has said that these are areas that the United Nations should grapple with. When it comes to digital trust and security, the Secretary General has actually proposed that the member states adopt a very high level political declaration that sets out how a secure, stable and accessible digital ecosystem is fundamental to the sustainable development goals and the achievement of the 2030 agenda. So he's asked member states to really talk about how there is a need for digital cooperation in a way that secures an open, free and secure digital future for everyone. And he's asked that this also be a multi-stakeholder process where there can be input not just from national governments, but also from civil society, as well as private and technology companies as well. So the call from the Secretary General for the international community to coalesce around a global statement on a safe, open and secure digital future is something that we hope that the international community will rally behind and it's something that, this, that the United Nations will be looking at in the next few years. So that's an area where we really hope that there can be some progress. Um, can I ask you about uh, maybe the responsibility that states have in bringing into accountab accountability sorry, certain companies? Like the debate right now in the U.S. Uh, leans toward breaking the duopoly that Facebook and Google has. And um, because they are, in truth, the gatekeepers to our data and our identities, um, and they also play right now a crucial part in shaping opinions uh, ahead of elections. So do you, is that something you believe the UN could maybe play a role in? And so this kind of links to a comment that I just saw in the chat from Anthony, when he said that if Mark Zuckerberg won't respond to a summons by the UK, what chance does an African or Pacific Island country have? against these big tech companies. And that is, I think, really the conundrum that we're facing here. These big technology companies have power that is way beyond that of a national government. And even if, and if even powerful countries like the US and the UK 
have such problems even bringing them in line. I'm not necessarily sure that the United Nations will have an ability that transcends what are essentially the most powerful states in the world. And this is something that I think in a lot of our realistic assessments about what the United Nations can do is a reflection of the reality. At the end of the day, the United Nations is only as strong as the member states allow it to be. And in some cases, it is the sum of what the member states are willing to come together to put their brains towards and sort of coming together around the idea of collective action. So at the point where I think it was Roxana who mentioned that there are already divergences in how the international community and the United Nations should approach key issues of digital trust and digital security. She talked about the differences in the, the open-ended working group and the group of governmental experts and the fact that there really hasn't been that much consensus among the member states on the best approach towards taking um, to take towards these technology companies, I'm not sure that the United Nations, which is fundamentally composed of these 193 member states, will be able to play that kind of role. Thank you, Yuping. Um, I would like to ask Robert one more thing before we head over to the Q&A section. We actually got some more questions now. Um, so how do contemporary digital infrastructures and digital transformation in general affect democracy? So far, I think you had a very positive attitude towards that. So, um, yeah, what do you think is the relationship between tech and democracy? No, I mean, you know, when we when we talk about technology, it is actually an enabler for, for a larger dissemination of information. However, this larger dissemination of information actually challenges our fundamental rights, as I pointed out earlier, that basically the right to secrecy, the possibility to actually ensure the, the formulation of our opinions is actually challenged. And, and with that, uh, we actually see on the one side, a positive tendency for, for our uh, opinion formation. But then when we talk about all the influences that come down to it, as also has been highlighted before with Cambridge Analytica, with all the AI, and the tendency to have filter bubbles. Yeah? So basically, the possibility to really screen all of that information. We are going towards uh, enabling the already activated, the already opinionated, to even be stronger in the way that they uh, foster their opinions and, and raise their opinions. So we actually are on a very tight balance on the one side of actually using the positive effects of this technologization of democracy and the negative effects of how it really will actually almost make our democracy uh, impossible to realize. So I don't think we have, have the answer right now, but it is a very dangerous path that we're taking at the moment and it can easily tip in one way or the other. Okay, thank you very much. I just see um, there's one more question for you. Um, at our introduction, you have called the digital society the next step of dig the digital evolution. Would you like yeah. to elaborate on that? Um, would you like to give us an outlook on what's coming after? <laughs> what's coming after? I don't have that, right? I mean, that probably is going to be the holodeck, uh, that we can be at whatever place in the world we want to be and we can set uh, the world in the way that we want to live in, right? I mean, it's basically the perfectionization of the filter bubble. But let's take the digital society of being the place where we want to engage in, the place where we actually are feeling capable of being engaged in, rather than the place where we are actually being located. Right. I mean, that's the big difference of the digital society. The digital society disassociates ourselves from the location, from the place where we are, which actually enabled this direct democracy in the first place. They actually enabled democracy as such when we all started to recognize each other as equal. Yeah. So the face was face to face society kind of was the enabler of democracy. And now the digital society is kind of like the, the, the celebration of democracy because we can put it where we want to be and where we actually can contribute. The only problem that we have, and that's what the Internet shows us, is that we have a tendency to go to the same. Right. So the Internet brought us instead of diversity, it brought us actually more of the same, we all go to the same search engine, we all go to the same media, we don't go to the small media, we go to the big ones. And that's what is the problem of human, uh, of the human mind. We wanna be with people that are thinking the same, but we actually need people that think differently from us in order to enrich democracy. And we don't have an answer at the moment for this. Thank you very much for this. Um, now I would like to go over to our Q&A section from the audience. Um, 
I'm just going to go with the, the most upvoted one. Uh, how can we trust CEOs like Mark Zuckerberg when he won't even show up to summons by UK Select Committee in what is a very important market for his company? What chance um, does an African country or um, Pacific Island state um, seeking accountability? Um, would you like to say something, Yu Ping? Or you were shaking your head? I think that was exactly the point I was making earlier. If the tech yeah. companies are not going to perhaps listen to what are their biggest markets or the most powerful countries in the world, then how do developing countries then have the capacity to, to rein them in, so to speak, or to ensure that they follow regulations that are not either national or international in nature? There's been all these talks about you know, how we need some kind of international regime. But even with the GDPR, for instance, we've seen how if there is inadequate enforcement or teeth behind it, you, it really becomes a legislation that has no real force. So in the same way, putting in place an international instrument without necessarily having the means to back it up, it's just going to make the situation much worse. You set up a certain type of expectations, perhaps the incredible costs associated with trying to meet those regulations, but what becomes the case if we don't have mechanisms to enforce them would become, I think, a worse global situation whereby there will be even greater sort of fracturing of situations where in some cases the regulations are applied and in some cases they're not. Thank you. Um, okay, we don't have much time. I'm going to do one of, more of the audience's questions and then we see um, how we get on. Uh, Roxana mentioned that many people are aware that their data, data is being collected but react um, or have nothing to hide. How can people be better informed about the implications of data collection? Uh, I personally would say it has to start in education, definitely. And I think we're starting to raise more um, awareness here. But uh, I would also like our experts to speak. So maybe, Robert, um, do you have anything yeah. to say? No, I mean, I think... Uh, uh teaching people about their possibilities is one way but there is nothing they can do if they don't have the technical means to do so right so the gdpr actually has set the right tone that we're actually getting this nasty question do you really want to accept all the cookies you have there and you know most people will still because of usability issues accept all but they have the possibility to say no which we didn't have before. So it's first about enabling and then teaching them what's right, and then we can do something. Yeah, a big problem is just convenience, I guess. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, do we have, okay, we, um, although I think we just have a few minutes. So um, would you two experts um, like to say anything uh, concluding? If not, then I will do another question. But if you would like to say something for a few minutes, then uh, maybe we can do so now. I actually have a so question, if you don't mind. Uh, coming back to the enabling part, uh, maybe do you believe that um, it is wishful thinking, but maybe companies could actually uh, provide uh, on their own this information to their uh, users instead of having them have to reach out for it. Maybe they could have like an interface where people could see every uh, bit of data that is collected. Sorry, the data, we have a minute left. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, any last words by the experts before we go back to the other session? I'm so sorry. About <laughs> no worries. I mean, just just the one thing. I mean, we need to make companies being able to do something else than collecting money. Right. I mean, then I would be uh, fully with you, Sukene, that basically you other interfaces. But if the only thing is to get more turnover, more money, more uh, benefit, then why would I do it as a company? Okay. Oksana, you have another three minutes at this time. Oh, was it? A, okay, so <laughs> it's one minute somewhere. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, you Ping, would you like to say something too? So, I mean, I think my comment today is that it's important for people like those participating today and all of you to really be very firm in what you want. And so that is part of the call of UN75. We want to hear what you want. And even though I'm very sometimes a bit too pragmatic or cynical about what the UN can or cannot achieve, it is people like you that hold us accountable and then set a higher standard for us to aspire towards. So my parting message to all of you is precisely what to keep doing what you're doing right now, sort of saying that this is what the UN should be doing. These are the ambitions that we hope the international community will live up to. And even though people like me will then say, well, it might be a little bit hard, you know, developing countries still have to work towards it. So long you show that commitment to A, hold us to account for what you think we should be doing, and B, also want to participate in this effort to make sure that it's not just developed countries, but also developing countries that have the capacity and ability to engage in a similar manner, then at least the UN has something to count on in terms of moving forward with engaged communities and constituencies like yours. And the youth voice is particularly important because, like I said, it is for the future of the, the international community and the world that we are trying to build a better world. 
So, Kena, if you would like to say anything now, um, I'm so sorry for interrupting you earlier. Um, I thought we just had a minute. Yeah, no worries. I fear it's too late now to delve into a new a new topic. We have just one minute. Um, maybe um, could could you give us your opinion on uh, regional improvements? And do you think that uh, they have uh, a way of becoming the norm globally? Maybe both Robert and you think. Yeah. You know, context is always the thing that matters to understand what's actually happening. So, of course, regional. Uh, requirements are key to actually learn what we can do on a global scale, but of course they differ so much. So it's hard to give this one recommendation for all. I agree with Robert. I also think that at the same time, there are lessons to be learned from various regions yes. and there needs to be regional champions. So if countries do feel that their example, their model is something that other parts of the world can learn from, mm. then to share best practices and information on how Absolutely. the rest of the world can learn from it is a good way forward to build cooperation. Thank you so much, both of you. I think we need to head back to the main session now. Right, Patricia? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Looks like we've got about 31 people right now. Um, it's, it's brilliant to have you all. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Venetia, and my co-host for this breakout session is Emma, who you can see on the screen. Um, and a big thank you to Damien, who's doing all the tech stuff behind the scenes. Um, and I'd like to extend a really warm welcome to our experts, Ivan and Lobsang. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you both. Um, so this breakout session will be focusing on issues pertaining to cybersecurity. We'll be spending about 30 minutes looking at the social, political and legal issues around cybersecurity. Um, so Emma will take the first 10 minutes when we'll be looking at some of the social issues and opportunities. I'll then jump back in to look at some of the political issues and opportunities. Um, and then Emma will take over again and she'll look at some of the legal angles of this. Um, and then we've left enough room for about 10 minutes at the end to take some questions from the audience. Um, so what we would really encourage all of you to do is to use the questions functionality that Tama talked about. So if you have a question, please put it in the questions section. Um, and when you're writing your question, please make sure to just read through what other people have written and upvote anything that you think is really interesting, because at the end, we'll go through those. And that's what we will be asking Ivan and Lobsang. Um, so to kick things off, just as a little icebreaker, um, we thought it would be good to ask our panelists um, what one word summarizes to them cybersecurity. So Lobsang, could I start with you? If there was just one word um, representing cybersecurity issues and opportunities, what would you choose? Just one word, right? Yeah. Privacy. 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 Thank you. And Ivan, how about you? I would choose trans transparency. Could you say that again, please? Transparency. Transparency, interesting. Um, and Lobsang, could you explain why you picked that? Yeah, I mean, when we talk about cybersecurity, right, like a lot of times we talk about the security aspect of it, right? So which is like, uh, how do you protect people? How do you protect all of that? And sometimes when you go into that space where you talk about crime, you talk about a lot of the other issues, you tend to think about privacy as something that doesn't really help. So it's like, if you want to be protected, if you want to have really good cybersecurity, then you tend to have to give away a lot of your privacy. So I think that's why like, I think privacy is a really important part of like when we discuss cybersecurity, because I think it might, when we kind of go from a perspective of just the cybersecurity part, I think we tend to leave privacy behind sometimes. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Um, and Ivan, how about you with transparency? I decided to choose this word because I believe that cybersecurity is highly connected to transparency. Transparency in processes, transparency in the country that you are operating, transparency in anything that can be related to the security on the internet. So from my point from my point of view, what I really believe is that you know if we really apply, you know, high levels of transparency in the way that we are doing things, companies are working on, I believe that we will achieve higher levels of high cybersecurity. Thank you. Um I have to say I think it's really interesting that you put picked similar but slightly different words. There's a lot of overlaps between privacy and transparency. It's looking at it from different angles, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be interesting to explore that. Um, one thing to note for audience members is if you hear any scratching in the background or see myself or Emma looking down, we're just taking a few notes because at the end, when we go back into the plenary session with all of the breakout groups, we're gonna be summarizing some of the key issues there. So just so you all know. Um, so I'm going to hand over to um, my wonderful co-host Emma now, and she's going to um, start asking our panelists some questions around the social issues and opportunities of cybersecurity. Thanks, Venetia, and thank you both as well to our panelists for being here. Um, so in terms of social issues, something that I kind of want to start off with is actually corporate responsibility, something we're all familiar with. We all use kind of Google and Amazon and things like this, and we use some of their devices, which people are becoming increasingly concerned that they're listening to us. So with Alexa and things like this, and I wondered if, uh, starting off with you, Ivan, whether you think that why is there this reason that people have become kind of distrusting of these major technology giants? Um, and do you think that any of these kind of devices are interlinked with that? Yeah, so, you know, it really takes a lot of time to gain the trust of the user. Um, it, take, it can take years just to gain, you know, the trust. And um, you need to operate at the level that the user expects. Um, I don't know if you follow you know, any, any particular news, but as an example, I have a tool that fails me when once my email you know, has been you know, um, found online for work because there, there has been you know, a data breach or something similar. You know, for me, you know, when I see you know, that a company that I provided my email address and also my details, my address, even my credit card you know, details sometimes, for me, that company completely lose the um, you know, my trust. Um, and when, it, when it comes to tech giants, uh, we all know you know a few cases. I don't think that we need to you know to disclose them at the moment. But um, when you when you you read some news, when you understand what's happening, you know you really notice that you can you can lose the trust. You can decide, oh, okay, if there is a one particular social network you where you have your profile, you can decide just to, okay, and maybe I don't want to be here anymore. Um, and maybe, you know, those guys, you know, were operating during the last 10 years successfully, but really takes just one single moment just to lose the, the trust for the user. And I believe that this is the case why many people potentially at this moment, you know, may, may have lost the, you know, the, the hope in many tech giants at the moment. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting that you said it only takes one, one experience for you to then not believe or just one story and quite often even if they're not necessarily coming from a place of truth, then still yeah. difficult to regain that. So Lobsang, with you, I know that you have done some work um, that kind of is looking to try and almost regain this trust. Do you think that it's something that's possible for users to regain the trust? Yeah, so I mean, like, I just want to kind of like talk a bit about like uh, from a context perspective, right? In the sense, like uh, if you look at different countries, like uh, I mean, like India, as well as like the Tibetan context. So you don't really expect trust from a lot of these big companies. So I think that's that's a different way of looking. Like for in the Western world, we kind of have these companies to kind of think of them as well. Maybe you don't trust them completely, but you kind of like hope that they will adhere to certain kind of norms. But like if you look at China and like a couple of other countries, like for example, if you look at like an application like a WeChat application, right, uh, which is a chat application, and you don't really expect that they will uh kind of like not share your data that they won't use the data for something so i think the question like kind of goes into the fact that there isn't even a question of trust it's just the fact that it becomes this normalization of that big tech will always use your data sometimes so i think so that's a different kind of like perspective i just want to share because i think sometimes it's like uh, uh I'm, I'm living in india which is more of a free country in terms of like what the work that i do so i would kind of like sometimes not trust some of the big companies in terms of what they do uh and like the amount of data for example i, I mean like i don't mind naming companies sometimes but when facebook and whatsapp kind of got integrated they said they won't share data with each other but then later on they started like wanting to kind of like integrate everything together so i think there's certain things about that which i kind of like uh, really kind of like dis disrupts people trust in some of these big tech companies because uh, they say something in the beginning and then like they change their policies, their privacy policies, and it changes without really consent, right? So I think there are certain big issues in that regard. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that that leads quite nicely onto my next point, which is actually to speak about deep fakes, um, which are an issue on social media. So for anyone who doesn't know what a deep fake is, if you're not familiar with it, essentially it's a piece of media such as an image, audio clip or video that's been doctored using deep learning technology to produce something that's fake. So some of you might have seen videos of Obama or Mark Zuckerberg 
seeming as though they're saying something when actually we know they would never say that perhaps. Um, this has been a massive issue for social media and then also particularly with political campaigns and Facebook have kind of said that they absolve themselves from some element of responsibility and they leave quite a lot of them up and they say that this is by way of education because if you leave them up when people can tell they're fake then that's fine because you're educating people but I wonder whether this is actually perhaps removing themselves from the situation and Ivan I wonder whether you think that is this the right attitude of platforms such as Facebook saying kind of we'll take a step back because by leaving these these things up that can be harmful and can allow cybercrime to happen um, do you think that should be more responsibility for them? You know um, what I believe that about the social network what I believe about, about any any company is that in, in general, general speaking I believe that we have made a lot of progress since the day one until the day that we are today but um, at the same time i believe that there is a lot of work to be done yet um i don't know imagine that as an example you want to read the terms and conditions of any of these companies it's going to be like, highly difficult for you to understand and for me and for anybody you know even a you know professional lawyer to really understand every single term and also it's going to take you hours i mean nobody is going to really read you know every single term and condition um nobody is going to really you know to to acquire, you know, to acquire all the information you know they need in order to access to any particular platform. When it comes to Facebook, when it comes to any to any company, I believe that they all have made a huge progress. Um, they are not inter I, I truly believe that none of them are interested in individual data. Nobody wants you know to know you know if I am you know in this particular restaurant at this moment. But of course, what they want is aggregate some data in order to have like some some insights. Imagine that as, as, as an example, you are in a, in a mall and you just want to see what type of customer you have. You know, if you are the owner of the mall, if you are, you know, you are working as a store manager, you want to see what, what type, you, what's the, your customer, how does the customer look like? Um, because maybe you want to do the merchandising in one particular way. It happens the same, you know, on the internet. On the internet, you know, they need some information just to, you know, adapt, you know, the style, adapt the websites, adapt how they are doing business. And just you know, offer you know what the customer wants in the exactly same way that is being done offline. However, what you offline is very easy to know what they are doing with your data because usually it's just one person looking at you and you know, until of course you know it's going to change. You. But uh, and, until now that that was everything they knew about us. Just one person looking at me. However, on the internet we didn't know if they were tracking our, our cookies. We didn't know if they were for how many days our cookie was tracked. You know, because sometimes you know our cookie can be tracked for 540 days, and that means that they can really have data for a year and a half, and that's a lot of a lot of time. They know how many times we can enter in one particular website in you know, in a year and a half. We don't want to really provide this information. So now we are in the right track. I'm now able to choose what terms and conditions I really want to accept, what terms and conditions I don't want to accept. Then we have cases like Safari blocking you know some type of cookies, which is something that is really good for the user they don't really want to share this information so generally speaking um i believe that there is a lot of work to be done but i also admire that a huge progress has been done during the last five to ten years if i just you know look at 10 years ago we didn't have any of this um, and i'm very proud that you know many companies are really you know taking a step towards you know, this area because they understand that this is are really uh, kind of a priority for many of the users, including myself. Yeah, definitely. I think that it's quite nice as well for you to bring a more positive attitude to it, because quite a lot of the time it's easy to slip into a negative mindset with cybersecurity mm -hmm. and think that it's kind of, we're going towards this doom and gloom, but exactly kind of workshops like this are trying to show that if we take control a bit more and actually perhaps use things such as education, then it can become better. I know that, um, Lobstein, for you, you've, um, you're a member of the Global Cyber Stewards Network and then also on the peer review panel for the Security Planner. I wondered if perhaps for those people who haven't heard of that, whether you could explain a bit about that. And also, I wondered if that's something that you think can be translated into education at a younger age, because we're all trying to educate ourselves as things go on, but perhaps some of these things can be prevented if it becomes more normalised to have cyber security training at a younger age. I mean, I remember when I was at school, we had we were told how to save, stay safe online with like MySpace or MSM, but the landscape's quite different now. It becomes a lot easier to be um, subject to fraud. Um, and so I wondered if something like that for you was 
is a focus. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Emma. Yeah, so I think uh, being part of this, like the Cyber Stewards Network, which was kind of uh, out of Citizen Lab, the University of Toronto, was a great experience because it was kind of a, a group of uh, researchers, uh, digital security activists, uh, kind of like people working on internet freedom from the global south, working with more like researchers in the global north. So it was kind of like a, uh, a set of people doing, I mean, like internet freedom work in various parts of the world and having various experiences. So I think it was a really good way of understanding what, as we were talking about earlier, what digital security means to us, what privacy means, what, uh, like all these different concepts, right? So I think there is, uh, even in different countries, different contexts, different cultures, the understanding is different. So having that experience was a great part of the understanding that. And I think, uh, yes, honestly, I think uh, we do need to know more about that because sometimes we tend, I think like uh, somebody who's like, uh, working in technology, like uh, we do tend to focus on more of a global north sometimes because a lot of the te technologies that we use do come from the north, and I think that's one part of it. Uh, in terms of like digital security for like from a younger age, I think that becomes a really important part of it. And the security planner that uh, I was on a peer review uh, is now kind of like integrated uh, as part of the consumer reports uh, in the US. So it is kind of an easy to guide, use guide for anyone. You just go in, you kind of select what you do, like what kind of devices do you use? What's your kind of like uh, practices online? And it gives you kind of your own uh, tech guide on digital security. So you follow a number of steps in terms of protecting your, yourself online. So I think that was a good way of doing it. And I think for youngsters, I think, yeah, uh, I don't know whether you want to call it like digital uh, cyber security or something, but something about digital hygiene. So I think there's two aspects of digital security. One is the whole aspect of like the cyber security side where uh, you want to protect your privacy online, you want to do a lot of that. But then there's also a lot of social issues with, with regards to uh, a lot of the social media tools or like, I mean, like we hear about all the like uh, impact that social media has, especially on young, young, young people, right? So I think there has to be more education in that regard. And, and when we were younger, like, I don't remember learning anything about digital security in my school. So I think like, yeah, I think starting to do something like that in school and, but focusing on the fact that it's about digital hygiene and not only just about like uh, talking about like the best cyber security stuff, right? Which sometimes tends to be more about like, uh, uh, I mean like, okay, so not to go into detail, but more about like uh, your banking and a lot of the stuff that we talk about, right? And so it's just like, I think digital hygiene, best practices. I mean, like we teach, uh, children when we were in school about health hygiene, right? And I think that kind of aspect of how do you teach children about digital hygiene from a perspective of health? So I think that would be a good way to start off. And I think uh, that will make an impact as you, as people go older and, uh, and like actually enter more of the digital space, right? Yeah, definitely. I like the comparison as well between the, the idea that, you know, if we're providing health hygiene, then we're using digital just as much and it's just import, as important. So, yeah, well, thank you both for your contributions. Um, next, we'll move on to um, the political side of things. So I'll pass on to Venetia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just before we start this section, I just want to remind everyone, if you've got a question, please post it in the questions section. Um, and if you don't have a question, um, I would really encourage everyone who's listening in to post the one word um, that stands out to you in connection to cybersecurity. It'd be really interesting to see if there are any themes that come out. So please do that. Um, in terms of the um, political aspects relating to cybersecurity, there are three areas that I'd like to explore. Um, the first being election interference and misinformation. Um, the second being the interplay between uh, tech giants and politics, particularly in a world that's increasingly globalized. Um, and then the third, to tie it back to the UN, is um, to talk about what's appropriate for the UN as a multinational organization and a multilateral organization um, in terms of cybersecurity within the political sphere. Um, so to kick things off, um, Lob Sanger, a question for you. Um, what political issue relating to cybersecurity are you most concerned about and, and why? Uh, so in terms of cybersecurity in relation to pol uh, in political, from a Tibetan perspective, I think is about censorship and like uh, a lot of the surveillance that happens, uh, especially for like Tibetan society Tibet. 
and like how a lot so i think it goes into a bit of like corporate as well like how a lot of companies might also be complicit in that and uh, how that actually leads to self censorship as well so it's i guess it doesn't really kind of like just talk about like just a political issue but i think it is about like being able to express yourself online and how that kind of like is stopped especially if you know you're being surveilled all the time and with the change in technology i think there's a lot more technology like for, for example like the facial recognition stuff uh nowadays like uh tibetan uh, for a few years earlier didn't really have like uh uh speech to text now there's more technology which allows you to do speech to text that actually is in some ways is a great uh, is a great advancement uh for the language itself but on the flip side it is being used more for surveillance so i think there are certain things about that so i think from a political angle i think there is that fact that uh different companies have different uh, restrictions different countries have different laws in terms of like how uh what security means and a lot of the national security um concerns in a lot of different countries can supersede a lot of the freedom of expression and the basic human rights right so i think that's uh that's the challenge that i and i don't really have a solution for that but i just want to stress that yeah i think that's absolutely fascinating that overlap between censorship and surveillance and then self censorship i i think that's so interesting particularly in the context of the rise of misinformation and fake news and how social media companies are are dealing with that um ivan uh, how about you what political issue relating to cybersecurity are you most concerned about you know i, I think that when we're talking about you know political issues and and I see all the fake news that we can find online. And um, when I see, you know, bots of robots and bots of networks, like really, really attacking, you know, news and really voting news to put, you know, that fake news on your eyes. I truly believe that uh, this is something that can affect, you know, a, a, an election. And, and, and we have the case of the US, maybe what said during the, there, ha there have been like a few cases where, you know, actually, you know, it's, 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 it's proven that you know that actually you know they were like bots you know actually like providing fake news and they were like you know, they, actually they were kind of trying to interfere in the elections so this can happen and this will happen from now on and we need to act we definitely need you know to provide some context in order to see how we can stop this and i don't really think that we need to expect that the a company is kind of doing something for you know to stop that i truly believe that we believe uh, that we need some some type of organization that is overlooking this type of issues and is kind of regulating so companies can act accord accordingly because at the moment we are just living in the hands of the companies to do you know what they find and yes sure i mean i i truly believe that they don't want you know um political integration or they just don't want any type of uh, um of issue using their ads or issue using their platform i truly believe that they don't want that but um the fact is that we definitely, we are the ones that need to take care of that as well. And I think that we are the owners of this particular area and we are the owners and that we need to take some steps in order to stop, you know, any type of, um, um, any type of issue that can be related to that. Mm. Mm, thank you. And that reads, leads really nicely onto my next question, which is how much responsibility do you think tech companies should be taking for the sorts of information um, that is spread on their platforms? I'll pose that question, question to Ivan first. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, all, the, all the information that we share on platforms, and this is something that, you know, companies can act. Usually, you know, um, they've been acting on that, and they've been, the, they've been saying if they wanted to stop the, what we were sharing, or they just, they were, they were deciding if we just, you know, they wanted to show this to other users. From my point of view, it's totally fine that they use some kind of, algorithm that is you know using you know some engagement kpis engagement indicators to show you know what people really like but at the same time i'm not sure if we need to leave on the hands of the companies what they need to just block what content they need to block or what's exactly you know the information that they don't they don't want to show i truly believe that at this point you know the companies you know are just platforms but they are like they are also doing some kind of um you know regulation at the moment because from my point of view there is some kind of a lack of regulation in this particular matter that is affecting you know all of them and this is exactly the reason why we see sometimes you know many political issues between i don't know you maybe in the u.s you know it's, it's been like more frequent but you know we've seen like some cases where you know they were like 
um, you know, um, some acquisitions from both sides. And this is exactly, you know, the type of things that is that are happening because there is no regulation at all in this particular sense in order to see, you know, what actually can, you know, be blocked or not. So my point of view really is like connected to really have like some kind of global view, global rules or something, you know, some kind of global organization that, you know, count, you know countries can really join and countries can really sign off and agree with that, those particular terms. And this company, this this organization is the one that should be really you know, establishing kind of the rules that all company that all uh, countries agree. And companies will need to follow that. But mm -hmm. at the moment, it looks like it's the other direction. It looks to me that companies are actually the one deciding, you know, what's the rule. And maybe, you know, if we don't like something, we're just raising our hands, you know, and just saying that we actually don't like that. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, of course, I don't really have one particular you know um solution at the moment but i truly believe this is a big issue that's affecting all of us mm. love saying would you agree that we're in need of better global regulation that that should be centralized in some kind of multilateral organization and how um do you think that could be achieved if so yeah so i think yeah as uh, ivan mentioned right i think there is a definite need for regulation uh and like as you're saying a multilateral approach i think it it does make some sense However, I think one of the issues there is the accountability. And so if they are not adhering to the regulations, what are you going to be doing, right? Uh, is there going to be some kind of like penalty, right? And then the issue comes into the fact that uh, this is kind of like an intermediary liability issue, right? So if somebody's posting something on social media, uh, the company becomes liable. So that is where another issue comes, props up, right? Like where a lot of the countries are using intermediary liability law to prosecute a lot of people. So an example of this was uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a, I think Pratachai was a, the, I think a Thai newspaper, or online blog, and somebody posted a comment. And the editor was prosecuted for that because of an intermediary liability. So, so what will happen there? I think there's a bit of a challenge there. So, and then that's why I was thinking about in terms of regula regulation, right? What would the regulation look like and what kind of format? And if it's going to be a lot of countries, it, I tend to see that it might actually go into a very bad direction. So I would actually prefer something that's more civil society based, uh, even though I understand there are certain issues in terms of like it being able to be regulated or like if countries or corporates sign up to it. But at least there will be some uh, better sort of control, because when it goes into a lot of countries, a lot of countries will tend to use what their internal laws are. So they might use that in terms to self-censor more people and regulate these companies to actually be worse than what they are right now. So I think that can, can lead to something else as well. So, yeah. Very interesting. OK, so you see it being more civil society based um, and you're worried about a lack of accountability on behalf of the tech companies? Yes. And yeah. but at the same time, like lack of accountability and how do you make them accountable? And like, so is it like an adherence to a code of conduct? that is actually like kind of like uh, uh, maybe it's an activist kind of organization. Like, so for example, something like the Black Lives Matter in the US, right? Where mm -hmm. like Facebook was being tried to be held accountable, even though it wasn't as much of a success because of the fact that like the numbers didn't make as much of a sense to Facebook. So they didn't really do that. But if the numbers made sense, they would be held accountable. So I think it may even be a grassroots kind of uh, process rather than like uh, UN led. Uh, mm. Because I think with the UN led countries will always kind of like come with their own like kind of like uh, agenda. And so I don't know where that direction might lead to. Mm. Mm. Interesting. OK. And then one last quick question for both of you. Um, and building off what you've said, what can we as citizens do to address some of the threats in this area relating to um, cybersecurity in the political political arena? And uh, I'll post that to Lobsang first and then to Ivan. Uh, yeah, as citizens, I think, as digital citizens, I think it's about being aware. And actually, I think it's also uh, it's getting together. I think like actually kind of like uh, mobilizing the global citizen to actually do something like further is kind of like boycotting certain uh, companies in terms of like what in the roles that they do. Because I think sometimes we do become complacent in, in our work and other aspects of like, if everything's bad, what's the, what's the point, right? So if some company is actually doing something bad, 
is there a way that we can actually mobilize the world, the global mobilization? So I think there is like, uh, there is, that's why I was saying like the, the need for civil society and kind of like to do some kind of that aspect because as long as it doesn't hurt the bottom line of, of some of these co corporates, I don't think there's going to be much change. So I think mm. it has to hurt the bottom line. Mm. And Ivan, from your perspective, with the need for greater global regulation, how can we, um, as citizens, push for that? What can we do? So I think that we need to demand that. I, I believe that at the moment we are definitely, you know, too focused on blaming some companies, but we are not really, you know, adding some kind of solutions. We are not really demanding to what we we actually need. Um, I think that this is a very short-term, you know, um, solution when we are just blaming one particular company and we're just stopping having one particular profile in one particular website. Definitely, this is not really creating some type of long-term solution that can avoid happening this to future generations. So from my point of view is, first of all, we need to have more knowledge about cybersecurity. I mean, any person that goes to the school, you know, maybe, you know, when they finalize university, potentially this person may have no knowledge at all about cybersecurity. And that, I believe, I truly believe that that can't be the case. Um, I truly believe that we need some additional knowledge and we need to understand how our data is used. And we also need to understand, you know, once we understand all of that, we will be able in a position to really ask for demands and really, you know, demanding something that can actually, you know, as follow for our problems in the long run. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the importance of educating ourselves, which is what everyone here is doing this evening. So good work, people. Um, okay, I'm going to pass across to my colleague, Emma, um, and she's going to explore some of the legal issues pertaining to cybersecurity. Thanks, Venetia. Um, so yeah, we've kind of touched on it slightly already about this need for regulation, which does end up tying into the law. Um, and I guess kind of a broader question to both of you to begin with is, is there a certain part of cybersecurity or an issue that concerns you where you think there could be um, a law and how legal assistance could be uh, could be beneficial? Because I spoke about deep fakes earlier, and that's something where there isn't a specific law which prevents deep fakes being used. However, there's defamation of character and other things that people can be prosecuted for. So, um, Lobsang, perhaps you could start off by an area that you think there should be a law on. Sure. Uh, yes, I think, uh, for example, like, I think uh, uh, in terms of the UN, right, like the UN has this like guiding principles on uh, universal declaration of human rights, and which is a really good principle in terms of like, uh, something that, uh, I mean, like not every con con country actually adheres to it, but at least there's a principle there that uh, we can hold certain countries accountable. So I think there has to be a global kind of understanding of what a cybersecurity is and what a cybersecurity law should be instead of countries doing their own. And even though like countries will still do their own because like every country does their own human rights and the aspect of it, but there should be something that's more global and that's kind of understood in that regard. So I think, I think there is a need for that. And like, uh, so from a UN perspective, I think as I think somebody else mentioned in the digital age, like is there a digital human rights policy that the UN should have? Uh, I mean, I, I know that you have some business and human rights and freedom of expression, but sometimes it is not for the digital age and not from the perspective of cybersecurity because countries will need to protect themselves. So I think there, there might be some give and take, but I think there has to be something that's more universally accepted. Yeah, well, I mean, you kind of stole my next point actually about the fact that should there be a, um, we have the universal declaration of human rights, should there be one for digital rights? Maybe Ivan, that's something that you could continue with. I'm aware that we haven't got that much time, so perhaps this can be our last question. And uh, if we have any questions from the audience, then we can answer those next. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, some of us are, you know, in Spain, I am in Spain at the moment, some people are in Spain, you are in London, uh, Lapsan is in India. There are people here, you know, in Iran, in Tanzania, I mean, in, in everywhere in the world. For me, and, and I truly really believe that at this moment that we are not that far um, however, the regulation in, in, in it's one of the countries where we are is completely different, you know, and I don't really believe that this is the way you need to proceed. I don't see this as something that can last that long, and this is generating a lot of issues. That's why, you know, many companies decide also to relocate to do some activities in some particular countries and they don't do it in others and things like that. And I think that we need to stop that. So in order to do it, I believe that, you know, a declaration, digital rights, 
you know, can be created, of course, but at the same time, you know, we also need to, you know, to make sure that the countries are adopted. And of course, they, they, are, they can also have, you know, their own details, because of course they also know them. That's, that's also good. I mean, they understand, you know, the country very, uh, very well, but, uh, but there is something that needs to be universally accepted. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And it's something that as a kind of, since we've been organizing the workshop, when we're obviously looking forward to how the United Nations can do something, it's been something we've come back to again and again and asked, is it possible? Because I think one of you mentioned earlier that again, it's how, did, how do you prosecute it? We have like the International Criminal Court that deals with violations of human rights, but how do you regulate it? Or perhaps is having something in place simply a good enough start? I know that Lob saying you referred to digital arms before and talked about them being able to lead to death the same as weapons and we try and regulate weapons so do you think that law is the next step to be able to help us take better control of cyber security uh, i guess yeah i mean like uh, i don't want to call it the digital arms but like i think yeah uh there has to be laws like i think it's as uh, i haven't said right there has to be a universally accepted kind of like norms and then if countries are not adhering to it, at least there's a way that we can try to hold them accountable. Right now, every country has its own. And so basically there's no like uh, universally accepted kind of like what is cybersecurity, right? And for example, just to give you one example, I think uh, when we talk about Huawei and the US, right? Everyone talks about that, the banning of the Huawei in terms of like uh, it being used in the, uh, the US infrastructure and stuff like that. However, there is an actual real question in terms of the cybersecurity and the national intelligence law that China passed in 2017. It actually states that if you're a Chinese citizen and a Chinese company, you have to, like in some ways, okay, not to put it bluntly, you have to spy for the government if they ask you to do that. So, so then like uh, if the US is actually saying that, it does make sense, even though Huawei might say that, oh, we, are, we haven't done it, we'll never do it, but then you are actually going against the law in where you are practicing. So there is a bit of a issue there. And I think that's where I think like it, there, it should be something that's more universal. So if you think like, okay, this is a law that can't really work in any other kind of framework, right? Like, because like, if you basically want every citizen and every company in your country to actually kind of like do whatever you tell them to do without any kind of like structure, how can a global business system, how can the internet actually work? I mean, like that's even the question of how does the internet work, right? Because like, if you can't trust the internet itself, like in terms of where it, it operates, right? Or the networks or whatever. So I think there is a fundamental issue of like, can we actually, is it like the time where, uh, I think the word, the balkanization of the internet, right? Like where every country has its own internet. So then you don't have to worry about cyber, cyber security from a different country perspective. You're just basically doing it in your own. So I think there is that challenge. And like, maybe there is the splinter net that might actually happen if there is not a, a universally accepted kind of system. Yeah, I think it's definitely something that's worth us kind of as well talking more about in the plenary discussion and even something that Tom perhaps will uh, mention tomorrow in the in the main discussion. I think at the moment we probably slowly will get people now from the other breakout sessions um, coming through, but I'll pass back over to Venetia um, and perhaps we'll have time to take one of the questions that we have from the audience. So thank you both. Yeah, I think we've got a couple of minutes left for questions. So looking at what has been put in the questions box, um, the most upvoted one is um, from David. Hi, David. Um, democracy is undermined because so few people vote online. Uh, online voting could help enormously to raise voter numbers. But will it ever be safe? So Lob Sang, how do you think we could make um, online voting more safe? Honestly, I think it is safe. I mean, like, as far as I know, like, and like, uh, I mean, like, I'm not an expert in terms of like uh, this online system, voting system, but I think it is safe. And like, uh, for example, like, uh, I think that's probably a better question for a uh, professor, like uh, from Estonia, where they actually do, they have the e-government set up, where they actually do a lot of online voting, e-vote and everything, and they have an e-ID card. So I think it is safe. I think it's a matter of like, how do you deal with it, right? So I think, uh, the question of whether it's safe or not, I think it's not. Can it actually be implemented in a lot of countries? Whether the resources, whether the skills that are needed to implement that, is that available? I think that's a different question. And I don't know whether it will be, uh, depending on which country you're talking about. But yeah, I don't really think that it's not safe if, because it has been implemented and it is being implemented, right? Thank you. 
Um, and Ivan is a digital consultant for um, a range of tech giants. What's your perspective? Do you think it's safe? Do you think it um, could be safer? Um, what do you think? Yeah, so first of all, I wanted to say that if we do things easier for the for the population, they are going to vote more. So I totally share this particular point. It's one of the bases in user experience, so I completely share this vision. I believe that it, it can be safe, but in some instances, you know, we will see that it's not completely safe. Um, we have, you know, some cases as the one of Venezuela where actually the company that was, you know, that was kind of the, the provider for the voting, you know, they actually recognized that, you know, there was almost a million of votes that were not used correctly in that particular sense. So if we have, you know, the correct audits as well in place, you know, we will make sure to do, you know, the voting system online is completely safe. And we, of course, you know, we're going to get additional population to vote in the system. Mm, thank you. Um, okay, we'll take one or two more questions. The next most popular one is um, for Lobsang. Uh, for many people, we don't actually know what kind of threat we face in terms of cybersecurity. Are we all in danger regardless of where we live? Uh, yes, I think uh, it has changed a lot, like because I think the online space has created a lot more space to do this. So uh, depending on what you consider a cyber attack, I think that's the question, right? Like, uh, for example, on a Tibetan scale, we talk about state sponsored attacks, which is like targeted email attacks, phishing attacks, where someone's trying to compromise your account, compromise your website. However, I think there are other issues that individuals can also face your private information being leaked online. Uh, your personal data being stolen, your credit card information being stolen. And this is happening a lot, right? And even with like, I think one of the things that we talk about right now is like the whole uh, malware where like, you know, I just forgot the word for it. So where your data is being encrypted, right? And you're being ransomware, sorry. So basically like, yeah, and that's not, it used to happen to a lot of big companies, but now more and more, you can see it's happening to smaller computers, some smaller systems, like even like smaller, uh, offices so it is spreading a lot and i think there's also this uh the minimum i think the skills required to do that has actually gone down because like this a lot more tools that are being shared online whether it's on the dark mm -hmm. web if people want to talk about that but even like on other spaces right so i think the space to do a lot of cyber crime is going down so i think that's why yeah everyone is at risk and if you're able to do adhere to some basic uh, digital hygiene you can protect yourself to a pretty good uh, setup. And, and it's not about like uh, that you need the best security software or something like that. If you do adhere to some basic uh, digital hygiene, it actually helps a lot. Wow, thank you. That is very interesting and helpful for the whole audience, I think. Um, so we've come to the end. Um, we're gonna give everyone um, a couple of minutes. Uh, you can either return to the main session or just go quickly get yourself a cup of tea. Um, but we'll be going back to the main plenary session and we'll be summarizing the discussions um, here in cybersecurity and also from the other two workshops. So we'll see you there. Welcome back everybody. I hope um, I hope those uh, those breakout sessions and the discussions were were constructive and um, everybody got a little bit of a of a, of an overall view of all of the different topics, all of the different conversations that are being had around digital security. As everyone has seen, um, it is very very complex and very very uh, extensive. But um, but I think that uh, I think that we've already gotten uh, an overview. So Sukaina, Emma, and um, perhaps Aditi um, will uh, summarize kind of what was discussed in these breakout sessions, and then we'll bring back on our uh, experts and we'll continue the conversation and try and discuss possible solutions to all of these issues and if there even are any. So um, who would like to start? Emma, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you. Um, so we had a really interesting chat actually. It was a nice, um, it was good to hear that actually is some positives that can come out of everything we were discussing. We particularly spoke about the social, political and legal uh, issues and opportunities of cybersecurity. But one thing in particular that we kept coming back to was actually a need for some form of regulation. So we obviously all know that we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and perhaps actually now it's um, the next step is looking for universal declaration of digital rights 
something as well that uh, kept coming up was education and the need for perhaps education from a younger age as well as now uh, to learn what our rights are and how to protect ourselves better online. Something that Lob Seng, um, the term that he used was, was digital hygiene. Um, so the same way in which we teach children about your kind of health, we also need to teach them how to be safe online and their digital hygiene. So overall, we covered, um, covered mainly, I think, that the need for regulation and education. Thank you for that, Emma. Um, that's super interesting and some new terms there that I, that I uh, have only heard a couple of times. Um, Sukaina is going to uh, give us some of the conversation topics from uh, Trust and Transparency. Thank you. So we talked about um, basically how we could do uh, what we could do to enhance uh, the um, current state of our regulations globally when it comes to how our data is treated and also um, how uh, techno technolo technology sorry, um, affects uh, democracies and um, the uh, democratic process. Uh, democratic process. So um, we acknowledged first that um, there was a discrepancy globally between peop um, countries uh, who were which were digitized and others who were still uh, developing. Um, but what was recommended is that we should um, try to build a structure uh, and kind of like a pathway for other countries to follow uh, using a uh, multi-stakeholder approach, which would involve civil society, companies, and um, also governments globally. Uh, we also recognize that the UN is only as strong as its member states uh, allow it to be, and that powerful countries, uh, which are housing big tech companies, also have a uh, responsibility not to let them uh, basically hold a monopoly over data. Um, and that also we should raise people people's awareness to um, what is going on. And uh, we should also maybe enforce a way for companies to uh, enable them to have access to that data, um, much like the GDPR has attempted to do. Uh, however, there were also maybe obstacles to that uh, in that if it's not uh, monetized, maybe company won't have an incentive to do that. Thank you, uh, Sukaina, for that. Um, we're going to, I think Aditi's back now, um, but Anahita can stick around, that's fine. Um, what I'm doing now, I've, I've put a poll up. I, I think everyone can see it right now. We're going to start using this progressively um, for, the, for our last section to kind of see, um, see what the reality is for everyone else. But Aditi is going to come on and speak about and what was discussed in the Human Rights in the Digital Age uh, breakout session. Great. Thank you, Toma. It was a great discussion, and it was lovely to see that all of us came to a consensus that we need rights, we need laws, and we need regulation. Right to access the internet, high time. Last six months, we have seen how much is it necessary. The need to have and recognize legitimate expression versus a harmful expression and the need to develop and inculcate consent culture, which needs to be built online as well, most importantly online, of course. Um, then it was felt that there has to be stricter and more efficient laws to protect from attacks, which we have in the physical space. We need it in the cyberspace. And therefore, we need the governments to push for rules in our digital, sp in our digital space. Uh, corporations figured into the entire converse conversation big time as the digital space is ruled by them in this current day and age. So there needs to be strict laws to rule their behavior where they have come in to manipulate the audience's behavior online, manipulate elections or be it natural behavior or consumer behavior, anything. UN can be an important body to do that since everybody looks up to them and every country in the world is a part of them. Then we came uh, to the point of uh, 
responsibility to address on a far larger scale these issues of um, digital digital behavior. The youth in today's world are one of the largest users of the digital space. They need to get more aware and more in, involved when it comes to digital security. And to sum it all up, it was all about creating on something on the basis of uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's high time that we have a Universal Declaration of Digital Human Rights. And uh, as Paul correctly pointed out, that the new uh, motto of UN is that no one should be left behind. So I think men, women, uh, transgendered, going beyond the binary. Every human being in the digital space needs protection, needs security to exist and express and have a peaceful experience in our digital world. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Aditi. Um, I think at this point we've kind of um, we have some main themes that have been uh, addressed right here. Um, we're going to wait a few a few seconds now. We're bringing our experts back on stage, and I also um, started a poll just a few seconds ago, um, asking if uh, asking the uh, you the participants and um, the audience everyone um, if you know what what the GDPR is. Um, from the responses that we got, we got 75% said yes, 25% said no. Now, I think the next question I should ask on the poll is, are you a resident or are you from uh, Europe? Because I, I'm i not sure exactly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and ask that actually right now. Um, are you a resident of the EU? Because... The GDPR is something that is exclusive to um, the European Union in the sense that um, unless you are a resident of the European Union or a citizen of the European Union, the GDPR as a regulation does not protect your rights online. Now, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, the GDPR is supposed to have the same regulatory effect on your information and on your data, regardless of where you are in the world. However, it is, again, exclusive to the EU. So it looks like from the poll that I've just started now, from the few responses we've got, we do have a majority of Europeans um, and a minority of non-Europeans. So the interesting question is, um, for Europeans in general, does everyone know what the GDPR does? Does everyone know um, what it protects? Does it go far enough? I know that these were topics that were discussed um, within the breakout sessions. And um, do we think that outside of Europe, this is something that we should have um, universally, globally, um, some kind of regulatory framework that is supposed to protect us as users online, to protect our data, and essentially limit uh, what can be done with our data but I think the GDPR also, for anyone um, who might who might not know exactly what it is, um, if you are in Europe right now uh, and you log into any website, you have this annoying, really, really annoying thing that pops up at the bottom of your screen every single time and asks you, um, you know, do you accept or do you want to know more? And that's essentially what the GDPR brought in. One of the things that the GDPR brought in, um, which was one of the aspects is asking for consent. Do you consent to everything that we want to do with your data? So the scary thing for me, and I think that this was discussed and I'd like to bring our experts in to weigh in on this. The scary thing to me is that essentially before the GDPR, we weren't asked for our consent on what was being done with our data. And in many, many countries still around the world, um, consent is not being asked. As a matter of fact, um, regulatory frameworks in many shapes and sizes have been attempted in many other places around the world. Actually, in the in the U.S., in the state of California, they they passed um, a regulatory act also. But there are still countries, just to name some examples that that I know of, um, like Venezuela or uh, Egypt, 
there is absolutely no regulatory framework in any way that regulates what the state and what companies can do with people's data. That, that literally means that any time any citizen of those countries logs in or shares any kind of information, willingly or knowingly or not, um, governments and companies can do as much as they want without consent. So I guess the next question, and I'll start another poll now to move on to the next topic, um, but I want to hear from, from our experts. Um, how far does the GDPR go far enough? Um, is it something that we would like to see implemented worldwide? Is it something that can be implemented worldwide? Um, is it maybe a step in the right direction? Or also something that was discussed is that it really is not um, being implemented well enough. So is it even possible? Um, would anyone like to weigh in? We can start with, with, with anyone. Um, perhaps Robert, would you, would you like to start? Sure. I mean, the GDPR is, I would say, a typical European compromise, right? I mean, every of the uh, 28 negotiating states at the time had the same say, and they all had to agree and had to understand. But what is clear is it's the first time that it provides us with the technical means to control what is being tracked about us. Right. If there wouldn't have been the GDPR, Apple wouldn't have started with their own new uh, uh, data protection review mechanisms and a new operating system, et cetera, et cetera. So it is an important agenda setting device. It is something which shows there is a market of 300 people that will not accept any tracking whatsoever, but it actually needs to come under a certain level of control. And it actually has quite some effect so that participants from the United States and European conferences come about like, you know, we need to get rid of this GDPR because it's really so annoying. But it will take some time until everyone understands what it actually provides, actually a little bit of control for the users. So it's a step in the right direction, but certainly not good enough. Thank you, Robert. Um, Yasmin, would you like to, would you like to, to contribute? Yeah, I mean, I have been working with some startups that have, you know, every startup has to comply to GDPR when they're set in Europe. And so this is, I think, already a huge step. But then on the same time, when you, you know, confirm that you're, um, you consent on uh, having your data being used, you know, it's the only condition that you have in order to use an app, for example. If you don't accept, you don't use the app. So it's a huge step compared to other countries and other regions, but I still think that we don't have much choice. If we want to use an app, we have to give up our data. At least we are aware that we're doing it, right? But it's um, it's already a start, and we should uh, value, and especially in Brexit time, I would say, you know, that you know, your concern about these as, as uh, Brexiters, I mean, that's people that, uh, as people that are living in the EU, uh, it's um, also a challenge, and uh, it reminds us even more on the um, importance to have uh, common uh, policies on regulation of data and protection of data. Thank you for that, Yasmin. Um, Lobsang, would you like to contribute? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know a lot about GDPR, but like based on like my understanding of it, in a sense, like. I always have a bit of a question when it comes to consent, in a sense, like, uh, is it informed consent, right? So there is an issue of like, how much informed consent is there? So in a sense, like when, for example, like whenever we go to a website or we tick on a privacy policy or something, uh, do people really, is it really informed consent? So that's one question about it. And it's, what's interesting is like, so if you are a website and if you have a customer or somebody that's visiting your website, in Europe, it does create certain aspects of it, which is interesting because like, it is primarily a EU kind of setup, but if your website is a global website, what does that mean? And if you're a startup, as uh, Yasmin was talking about, uh, what are the impacts in terms of being able to comply with it? And it is, I feel like sometimes there is a bit of a challenge and I think there is, there is still some need uh, work to be done in that regard as well. 
I, I just want to, uh, we'll continue, but I just want to bounce back on what you said, Lovasang. In, in terms of regulatory frameworks, because I know that you work very specifically on issues of uh, not only just data exploitation, but actually surveillance and, and also trying to educate and teach people about um, how to, what, what, you, what you termed um, digital hygiene. Um, so something like the GDPR, is it something that we want to see? Is, is it something that we want to see globally? Is it, is it a step in the right direction? Can it, can, it, can it solve some of the issues that you deal with in terms of cybersecurity? Yes, I think it is. Uh, yeah, as uh, Professor uh, Robert actually mentioned earlier, it is a step in the right direction. And I think it's about like uh, the regulator, the regulations aspect of it, right? Like because it has to have some regulations, otherwise comp corporates tend to. Go. But at the same time, as you mentioned, it's about twenty for the EU one. It was twenty eight different countries, right? So if you want to go global, uh, from a UN perspective, how many of the big countries will push for certain aspects of it? So what can be done to change that, negate some of those frictions of the all the powers of like the major superpowers, right, in terms of the regulations that they might want to have in this. So does that mean uh, the civil society, does it mean that the civil society should have a largest uh, space to talk about this in the regulation aspect or the technical or the IETF or any of the like global more like uh, technical space? So I'm, I'm just kind of like uh, wondering what should be the optimum level of that because otherwise, yeah, if it just goes into a country specific, right, sometimes I do tend to, think on a sense like some of the larger countries or more powerful countries, especially at the UN, will change it, not for the better, but for the worse. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Thank you. Um, Bishaka, would you like to, to weigh in on this? Sure. And I my hope for quite similar to what Lobsam said, actually. You know, it's interesting because in India, we now have a right to privacy, but we don't have data protection laws yet. And unless data protection laws, you know, are built around sort of thinking of human beings as data subjects, right? They're anyway kind of insufficient. But I want to really re emphasize, I think, what Lobsang already brought up. I think GDPR is definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, but it assumes that the consent you give to platforms is meaningful and informed consent, and I completely disagree with that, frankly. Yeah, I just don't see how that can constitute any threshold of informed or meaningful consent. So just to, just again to, to react to what you just said, um, what represents, this is a, a quite a difficult question, what represents informed and meaningful consent if we were to you know as a civil society if we were to, to address um if we were to address national international organization what represents informed consent um i can have a go at this the, yeah go ahead go ahead okay you know what it is a tricky one i'm going to very quickly try and say one is i think at the fundamental level you have to be able to understand what you're consenting to, right? Which means that the kind of language that's used cannot really be what I'm going to call legal, legal gobbledygook, basically, which you would need like, you know, a PhD or something to understand. Neither can it be like so lengthy that it would take you like three weeks to read it, right? So I think it, there have to be principles. And I think in Canada, the privacy commissioner ruled a few years ago that you do need to have accessible communication, which should be easy to understand sort of for the vast majority of users, right? Not for like very expert kind of users who are like very highly educated, etc. So I think we have to think of those. And I think we have to really clearly be able to state what, how the data is being used, etc., stored. But I think the other point about consent is, you know, if you have no real choice, and it's kind of a philosophical question, right? Every time we download an app, if we don't really have a choice, is that really consent? If we have to keep accepting terms in order to use that app? Thank you, Vishaka. And again, you raise... 
even more interesting topics we could go on forever and ever and ever about uh apps that for example the covid crisis um has brought up the necessity for governments to rely on track and trace systems and using apps and we're we're, we're caught in between the idea of being able to help you know positive outcomes but then outweigh, weighing them against the negative outcomes of of you of using an app um maybe we can talk talk about that later but uh, i'd i'd like to hear from um from you ping chan to weigh in on uh, on the gdpr on regulation on consent um the role of for example the un also in 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 this uh, in this aspect i mean to be very frank again I think that we are a long way off from having the UN negotiate something similar to the GDPR on a global scale. I think Lop Sang has already said and pointed out very clearly that the way we are, where we are right now in the tech community and the geopolitics of tech are such that it's unlikely you'll find agreement on very general areas, much less something as specific as data protection. So I really do think that that is really in some ways perhaps a longer term aspiration and that if we could even get basic agreement from the major countries of the world on basic principles of how to use the online space that will be a major achievement much less something as detailed as a gdpr so i understand that you know it is something we aspire to that there should be some kind of global protection of data regime but i just not i'm not sure that we at the united nations or the current international climate allows for that kind of aspiration so it is something perhaps ultimately we could aim towards i mean i would also say that and i think i made this comment a number of times in my breakout session as well that when it comes to data protection when it in, at the very basic level, the bulk of countries, many countries in the world don't even have access to broadband connectivity and internet and digital technologies. 3.6 billion people in the world remain unconnected. So for all of these people, these concerns about privacy protection and data protection are in some ways a pipe dream. And that the United Nations in many ways, and for many developing countries, the challenge is even giving people that basic connectivity and access to digital technologies. So in many ways, this is a longer term important goal that we should be working towards privacy and protection, privacy protections and so forth. But for many countries, the focus really is on being able to access and use digital technologies in a meaningful way to, for their own social and economic development. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Yu Ping Chan, for, for those comments. So, what I've gathered from that is that although we have these longer term goals um, in terms of internationally, um, it's kind of like a stepping stone because I suppose we're at the very, very beginning of, uh, of all of these things. So the GDPR is a step in the right direction. It is something desirable. Maybe it is something that we believe that works, um, but it's, it's stepping stones, I suppose. So I'm going to move on um, directly to... Um, uh, our, our next topic. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a poll. Um, I want to talk about more specifically about digital hygiene, um, education, and online behavior. So um, encountering hatred, um, dealing with issues of uh, the same issues that we see in in day to day um, issues of racism, sexism, and just all out hatred. It seems like it seems like with the um, with this entering into the digital age, that this hatred has become almost more visible or maybe even more intense and more present. It seems like we feel as um, a society, a global society, that we have become even more divided, even more divisive speech um, online. So the question is, um, first of all, is this the case? Does uh, the use of digital technologies and the rapid spread of digital technologies, does that incentivize uh, more and more divisiveness, more and more hatred? Or on the contrary, is it a way to actually uh, bring people together to create bonds? And again, a regulatory framework. Do we need to create some kind of regulatory framework to make sure that people's rights are being respected online? Who's responsibility is it who is accountable is it companies tech companies like facebook twitter and so on is it the responsibility of individuals so then the question of education and so on i'm going to ask a poll now but i'd like to start the conversation um maybe um with our experts weighing in on on, on what you think about these things um let's start with uh, let's start with uh, with uh, 
Well, let's start with Yuping Chan because Yuping Chan ended the conversation. We'll go in the other direction. Hi, sorry, Toma. Um, mute and unmute button is clearly lessons still to be learned. No, it is an interesting question, right? And I do think that that is an area of work that the UN is working on to address what are possible harms of the use of digital technology. So the converse to, you know, as we get more digital, and I think the experience of COVID has really shown that digital technologies is now fundamental to the way we connect and work and learn online. Then convert, at the same time, it exposes us to greater harms and vulnerabilities. And I think at the United Nations, we're quite conscious of that, that even as we preach, for instance, as I just did, that connectivity is so important. How then can we build protections for this kind of connectivity in such a way that we avoid the harms that you spoke about? I think there is that comment in the chat, for instance, from Mick, where he says that 3.6 billion people will be connected at some point in the future. I'm not necessarily sure, Mick, that it will be soon, but the goal is ultimately to connect them. So perhaps you are right that what is important that the infrastructure and digital environment that they eventually are connected to is already safe and secure from the start. And this is why, for instance, building the privacy protections or the protections against online harms from the very beginning in the infrastructures that are then used to connect the unconnected is important. And so part of the discussion at the United Nations is how to ensure that these types of protections from online harms are part of the conversation from the very start on the issue of how do you connect those that are currently offline. Thank you, Ping. So, so the idea of, uh, of 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 bridging the digital divide, as as they call it, um, it is something that's desirable, but it also highlights many, many, many issues that need to be. Maybe you you will agree, and and I'll extend the question to to all our experts. This, uh, while we're bridging this divide, we also need to be building these stepping stones and the framework because there's no use in 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 in. Uh, multiplying the number of users online if we're facing the same issues and just multiplying the number of issues and, and the number of problems that we're facing. Um, Yasmin, maybe you would like to weigh in on this. Yes, I mean, I think it is important uh, to democratize the access of the internet and social platforms. And it's not because we face issues that we should be privileged to be a small number of people facing them and the rest, they're just, you know, kept out of this sphere. But then, as I was saying uh, previously, um, if I, in the street, am the target of violence, my government should protect me. And so likewise, on the internet, if I am the target of violence, my government should protect me. And so what, what I would uh, um, ask for is legal protection from governments um, um, to their national users. So if I'm using the internet and I'm facing threats, I shouldn't wait until this threat becomes a physical threat and a physical, you know, attack until um, my governments take action. And so more concretely, uh, to rethink uh, the way uh, we um, as citizens are being protected on the Internet, and especially um, when it comes to hate speech, um, I don't think that there is only hate on the internet there is also good sides of the internet you were asking this question it is you know very binary i think there is a nuance in this but at the same time um hate people and trolls they're very well organized and so we need also to make sure that we deconstruct this cyber crime because it's a cyber crime and it is instrumentalized uh, and paid very well by lobbies that are just, you know, in charge of uh, creating division and, uh, and, and debates on the internet. So we need to make sure that our governments are held accountable and protect us for this. Thank you very much. Would, any, would anyone like to jump in and, 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 and weigh in um, on, what, on what Yasmin just, just, just said? Can I add to that? Go, go ahead, Bishaka. Okay. So I totally agree with what Yasmin said. And, you know, I was thinking about it. I think the dilemma with online spaces is the platforms feel like streets because they're public, but they're actually privately owned. So they're kind of like malls, at the, although they feel like streets. And so apart from governments, I think it's also very important that platforms now take responsibility, right, for hate speech, online violence, all the things that happen in those spaces that they own and they be held accountable. 
And I think it's no longer possible for platforms or for anyone to actually say that uh, platforms are not shaping hate speech, right? Because through the use of algorithms, through the use of echo chambers, through sort of, you know, a business model, which is essentially built on sort of speech, which is more extreme, right? Getting more sort of advertising, et cetera, et cetera. It's, we are seeing that through disinformation, through so many things that it's no longer what we thought five years ago, that it's just, you know, that there's so much sort of hate offline and it's being expressed online. It's now actually being shaped by the design and the sort of architecture of platforms online. So I genuinely believe that it's time for both governments and platforms to start dealing with these. And I think the UN and governments have an important role in pushing corporations to be accountable. Thank you for that, Vishak. I, I think that, that that makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, Lobsang, you want to speak? I, I don't know if Robert yeah. wanted to speak no, earlier. No, it's okay. 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 So yeah, I mean, I just wanted to kind of like uh, talk a bit about like when we talk about like online space, right, and the social kind of like structure that's in the online space. The human social structure has taken taken like hundreds of years or millennia to actually be at where we are, and the online space was in the last few decades, and I think. That's why where I go back to like education and access, right? When you talk about access, I think the education has to be part of it. Like, how do you like? I don't want to kind of like talk about like the moral kind of aspect of it, but behavior online. What is what constitutes bad behavior online? Kind of like that education from a really ground up, kind of like I think can make an impact because right now like everything that's online, in some ways it is reflecting the community, but is I think one of the questions that sometimes when we do a workshop or a discussion about social media, we say like, I'm having a conversation with someone and we disagree, but I wouldn't really like kind of like say something like terribly like uh, kind of like uh, abusive to the person that's sitting next to me in a, in a general context, but online is a completely different space, right? So our social structure that has taken millennia to actually go to that space is not online because you don't see the person you don't consider them human so i think there has to be some sort of education when we talk about access and kind of like digital education what does that mean what does it mean to be online what does it mean to uh practice free speech what does it mean to allow somebody else to also practice their own free speech right so i think there are certain aspects of it i think that maybe it is something that we talk about like or teach when you give access i think when there's more access Thank you, Lobsang. So, so the an important thing to take into consideration is the education. Also, there's no point in putting in place a regulatory framework if we're not educating people and young people. I mean, I mean, we're talking here. Um, I think it's very important to to highlight young people because we're the ones that are being hateful online when we could be being loving online no yasmin disagrees <laughs> you think it's all you think it's the older generation that are being hateful i mean i come from a country i'm italian right by roots and by birth i come from a country one of the oldest country uh, in, in the oldest in europe and one of the oldest in the world and as in europe we are an aging country uh, region um i can say that yeah sometimes people who are hateful are not the youngest and uh, it's really something to deconstruct a, a stigma that young people have. So that's my. Yeah. That, that's that's really interesting. Obviously, th this is something that I wanted to bring up to to get the conversation going. Um, I I probably do agree with you. Um, I I think one thing that is shockingly um, obvious right now is that in terms of leadership. Um, we're talking about regulations and things like that. So if we want to implement these things in the states, we need leadership. Now, when we look at currently, um, you, you know, we can't avoid the US elections coming up and, and turning on our TV screens and seeing two 70-plus-year-old um, men um, battling it out on stage 
uh, talking about uh, things like tax returns and 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 so on. Um, it is it is puzzling to see that kind of situation. So I, I, I definitely take into account what Lobsang said regarding education. And I think that there is a huge necessity to to bring in young people into the conversation more and more and more and more. I think the UN can play a huge role in that, and and I don't know if you agree, but um, but yeah, I just because we're 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 getting we're running out of time. Robert, would you like to add something on this topic? Yeah, I mean, I I just want to make you all mindful about what process we're in. Right. I mean, uh, as Lobsang has said before, I mean, we have this long process of of building our society, of building our transactions, building our communication. And the digital space is only so young. Essentially, what we have learned over the, let's say, the last 2000, 2500 years of, of, of democratic rule of actually having identity between the rulers and the ruled, which is this core achievement of our societies that we're actually able to free ourselves from this one person that is deciding our fate. All of us are deciding our fates. And now we are basically having technology deciding for us what is possible. And that has been throughout time. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about the face-to-face -face society, it was really about how can you communicate? And only when you had ways of communicating more than beyond your own village, you were able to build the territorial states. Yeah. So nation states and with that representative democracy. And when we come to the U.S., right, I mean, I think probably the U.S. democracy might call itself to be the greatest democracy on earth, but probably it's also the oldest and outdated uh, democracy that we can say. I mean, the electoral rules are more than 150, maybe 250. Uh, but last but not least, we have the digital space now. And a lot of the rules for the digital space are actually formed by international law, which in the end still thinks that we're on a ship. And that means the captain is in charge, right? And so in that sense, the pl private platforms are in charge, which are the ships of the modern age. And we need to finally grow up and coming up with a regulatory framework for the digital space that actually works, that actually brings us to a unity, to an identity between the rulers and the ruled, and make us enabled to take charge. And that's what we need to build, whether that's the UN, which is probably our biggest hope for getting there. But in the end, I somehow have a feeling that we first need to fail with this first global network and have to rebuild the technology from scratch to actually enable user rights and actual this enablement of all of us to be able to govern this space in a way that's good for humanity. Thank you, Robert, for that. That, that was that was extremely insightful. Um, I think we've covered a lot, a lot, a lot of topics and we've made a lot of ground. I want to remind all our participants that the, the chat func the sorry, the questions function is still there. Um, I'm going to go through a few of the questions now, just so we make sure that everyone's happy. Um, the chat function, unfortunately, we're not we're not trying to use it too much. Um, I did notice a mentioning earlier of um, you know someone coming back on what you Ping Chan um, on what you said um, on the fact that 3.6 billion are not yet connected, but they will they will be soon enough. Shouldn't they have the protections that we that will be got from lessons we have learned? So the same idea that. As well as bridging the digital divide, we need to, at the same time, urgently, urgently, urgently be, be looking at regulatory um, frameworks to protect people online. Um, so our highest upvoted uh, question is for education on digital hygiene, how to deal with the evolving nature of cyber insecurity? And is there a corresponding need of education of adults as well through work and other spaces? So here the question of, 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 of age, maybe in generation, um, comes back into the discussion. Um, Lobsang, would, would you like to comment? Let's try and keep our comments as short as possible um, because we're running out of time. We only have about eight minutes left, but I do want to get through some of these questions as, as quickly as possible. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, uh, I think with changing scenario, right, uh, there has to be better digital hygiene. So I think 
you kind of make sure that depending on what the situation is, what the culture is, making sure that the digital hygiene that you're talking about actually is relevant. And I think age is an issue, uh, but like uh, the generation like that I grew up, like we didn't really have computers up to like I was about, I don't know, 18 or 20. This new generation, they've been like, they are the technology age, right? They are with digital tools since they were born. My, pre my parents' generation probably started using something in their 30s or even 40s, right? So I think there is a need because a lot of the people who are being uh, victims of cyber crime tend to be older in terms of like some of the issues, right? So I think there is the need for education, but it also depends on like what kind of education that you are talking about and like the demographic that you want to talk about. So I think there's different aspects of it. And I don't think digital hygiene is the same for everything. So yeah, don't want to go into detail. But... Okay, thank you. So again, the need to be inclusive, as inclusive as possible, in how we address these these issues, because um, no one issue is the same for for any individual, regardless of of, of age. Um, another question here on the top of our list: an issue cutting across the workshops has been perceptions of diminishing UN credibility based on a view that it is controlled by its member states. Interesting to see that in the digital space there is a push for influence. How to reconcile this? So, of course, Yu Ping Chan is here <laughs> representing the UN, but I don't want to put this uh, solely on you. So go ahead and, and give us an answer. And, and, and if anyone else wants to jump in, please. I think let's be realistic, right? Fundamentally, the United Nations is dependent on the member states. There's no getting away from it, even though some of us might not like it. And this has led to real problems in many areas, including human rights. But the thing is, when it comes to digital space, I think the United Nations Secretariat itself recognizes that you're right. It cannot be a discussion purely among governments, government to government, and that you have to bring in other stakeholders as well. And that's why if you look at the work that the United Nations is doing around the digital sphere, digital cooperation, for instance, the report of the Secretary General in June, the high-level panel on digital cooperation, he has very clearly emphasized that it is a multi-stakeholder process, that part of the conversation has to also include, for instance, civil society, the private sector, technical experts, scientists, as well as governments. And that in the engagement on these issues that we talk about connectivity, digital trust and security, digital human rights, all stakeholders have to be at that table together. We've also talked about in some of the workshops, the fact that we cannot control, national governments cannot control tech companies, that a lot of times they are too powerful cross borders and that we can't hold them accountable. So at that point, they have to be part of that conversation as well. We've talked a little bit about how like voices such as civil society are the ones that can voice the concerns and bring human rights violations or concerns about privacy and protection to the table. And in some ways, that is part of the inclusive conversation that we need to have around digital governance. And that is something where the United Nations recognizes that because of whether it's credibility issues or the fact that in the digital sphere, in order for any policy or any discussion to have long-term impact, it really must engage with all stakeholders, not just governments. So I do think that you are right that there is that concern, that there will always be the United Nations that is at its core 193 members. But when it comes to cyber and digital, there is a realization among the United Nations Secretary and specifically by the Secretary General that the conversation has to include all. And this is why I put in my pitch again that young voices, youth voices, your voices are particularly important in part of this conversation because it is you that hold us accountable and say, this is the digital future that we aspire to and that the United Nations cannot be bound by 193 countries, that we really need to work towards something that is bigger, broader, more inclusive and holds people to account. Thank you for that. Um, I think that the digital space offers a new horizon for the United Nations, something that, had, that wasn't available when the United Nations was created. And so this is definitely something to consider. Um, I think that um, the the the, the multi-stakeholder approach is a very important one. Um, civil society, governments, and international. But we know now, again, talking about leadership, that we can't rely on governments. We can't rely on the current leaders that we have. And I'm talking from a European perspective, but I have I have my friends. I have experiences all over the world where leadership is is hugely hugely problematic. So I just I just like to we, we have about three minutes left. Um, uh, we have so many questions, but we don't unfortunately have time to answer them all. Um, I'd like to take closing remarks. Uh, we have three minutes, so not much time. But if um, we could end on a little bit of a positive note, that would probably be nice. 
um, talking about the future of, uh, of, of, of the digital age. Who would like to go first? Go ahead, jump in. Okay, can I? I'm just going to say, uh, I think I would love to see two things. One is digital literacy literally starting in schools because we're using uh, digital devices at younger ages. And, you know, we should be prepared to sort of use them and sort of have a sense of ethics, the space, like a whole bunch of things. So I think that would be great. And I think, again, it is time actually to update the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from many perspectives. And one of them is certainly the digital. So maybe not a separate kind of thing, but really an updated Universal Declaration of Human Rights that puts the digital very much at the center since our lives are now pretty much digital, right? Like both physical and digital. Thank you for that. Robert, would you, do you want to say yeah. something? Or you... No, I mean, I think, I'm, 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 I'm not sure that we actually need to update the Universal Declaration. I think we certainly need to interpret it newly with the digital age in mind. I think that has been a much more promising approach than rather finding this consensus again amongst all the stakeholders that have signed it so far. So whether you do one way or the other, important is that it happens. And I fully agree with you on that. The other thing is, let's bear in mind that the way that this global society is being shaped is technology. And if the technology is flawed, there is not much what we can do. So we really need to work on getting this technology working beyond uh, interneting, meaning a just connection between two local area networks, because that's what the internet actually is. It is a protocol for connecting local area networks where in the end the, the, the administrators can get together. We need to take charge, we need to develop, we need to do research, we need to get and find ways on how to actually govern this digital society with having the technology in mind that it actually built. So that's the important part. We cannot talk about international human rights without having a under, true understanding of technology and actually being willing to shape the technology and not only to outsource it to private vendors that have their very own monetary interest at mind. We need to take charge as a society all together and build that and uh, not having this top-down approach, but rather bottom-up from the people that we all are. And for that, we need to educate each other. Thank you, Robert. Um, Yasmin, closing remarks? Thank you. Um, I couldn't agree more, uh, especially on the approach. Uh, the need to have bottom-up um, approaches and building uh, on these digital spheres and reflecting on not only the challenges, but especially the opportunities. And as we uh, also can have uh, a positive, you know, and, and closing with a positive note, um, I would like to remember, remind of the huge opportunity to use machine learning for improvement in society. And so, for example, when we have a new technology coming, I would like to have, besides this engineer, a diversity consultant, because if a, mach if a machine has a bias, if AI has biases, it is because human have biases. And so we need not only declarations and uh, rules, but also concrete action plans. And for example, the European Commission just released the anti-racism action plan. I would like to see the same for the digital sphere, an anti-racist digital action plan. So this is my closing. Thank you, Yasmin, and, and those are extremely, extremely strong and valuable uh, comments. I, 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 uh, I can't agree more. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tomo. So yes, uh, I was just uh, kind of like when uh, Yu Ping Chang, when you mentioned a bit about the UN, right? And I think it's kind of in a sense like uh, there are limitations about the UN and there are certain aspects of it uh, that kind of sometimes really kind of makes me kind of like, oh man, what we can do better. But at the same time, I think, this is what we have. And I think we have to realize that. And the whole aspect of like, how can actual multi-stakeholder actually work at the UN? I think it's something that we should strive towards because 
even though like uh, we have the Internet Governance Forum, which is supposedly a multi-stakeholder platform. However, what most of us do know is like a lot of those spaces, even though it is multi-stakeholders holders set up, there are certain aspects of it where it doesn't really work in that format. So as you're mentioning about the digital space, I think maybe it is a way about like, I think because the discussion that we are talking about is the UN 75, right? Beyond. So is it the way that we actually need to rethink how the UN actually works? I know there's a member state, but can actually multi-stakeholder system be have a space at the UN? Uh, so I think, yeah, I want to end on that note that maybe there's a way forward and how does the corporates and the civil society actually make sure that something like that can happen? I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't have a path for it, but I, I can hope, right? Thanks. Thank you, Lobsang. Again, extremely, extremely valuable, valuable, valuable words. Um, let's finish with, uh, I believe everyone's spoken about you, Ping. Um, we'll, we'll finish with your, your last remarks and then, uh, and then we'll... Uh... Um, I just want to pick on what Lok Sang said. In the digital sphere, I think the United Nations is committed to try and make multi-stakeholderism work. And so, for instance, the Secretary General is proposing an AI advisory body, which will be multi-stakeholder. And a lot of his proposals for how we take forward some of these key digital issues are multi-stakeholder in nature. So we will try our best. But what we really need from all of you is your committed voices to saying how this is important. So in your advocacy with your national governments, in where you speak out and your forums, you have to talk about how digital governance and these digital issues require multi-stakeholder engagement and these kinds of conversations that we're having here today. So I guess my closing words is continue doing what you're doing, speaking up. Young people also particularly must come to the table because the future that we create through technology will be the world that you inherit.